announcement that I wanted to make. Uh, first of all, uh, I want to tell you about the structure of the program. We are going to have four sessions that are spanning across two days. Uh, in your portal, you will find the details of the program and the sessions. Uh, I would just request to be present for the entirety of the workshop because we'll be taking attendance for all the sessions and only those participants will be awarded certificates who have attended the entire sessions, the four sessions whenever you read about, about this workshop and about the proceedings here. And without further ado, I would like to call the Executive Director of the Strategic Vision Institute, uh, Dr. Naeem Salik, uh, to please come for the further remarks for this workshop. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Naeem Salik. And uh, good morning to everybody. It's indeed uh, a matter of great pleasure for us to have you all here. Uh, for this workshop, uh, we uh, re realize that it would be uh, inconvenient for uh, everybody to get up early in the morning on a weekend, uh, uh, which you look forward to for uh, having uh, a good nap in the morning and uh, uh, be relaxed. But I think uh, this is an important activity, and why we planned it on a weekend was that since we are uh, mindful of the fact that these teaching semesters are going on in all the universities at the moment and uh, you are uh, closing in with the uh, midterms uh, or uh, in fact uh, the final exams are also uh, not very far. So we didn't want uh, you to miss your classes. And that is why we planned this event on a weekend so that uh, it does not clash with your academic activities at the universities. Uh, this workshop uh, uh, is not uh, meant to uh, just deliver lectures to you. Uh, we would like it to be as interactive as possible. Uh, we would be giving presentations uh, and uh, uh, discussing with you various issues, but we would uh, uh, expect uh, a very active participation uh, from all of you. Uh, please do not carry your doubts home. Whatever uh, issues, questions, doubts are uh, bugging your minds, uh, you can clarify uh, these uh, uh, at this venue. Uh, please don't hesitate in asking questions whenever uh, you get an opportunity and we will give you ample chance even towards the end of the uh, last session tomorrow uh, that if still uh, some issues, uh, some idea, something is left unaddressed, uh, you can raise it. And you would understand that in any given presentation, one can cover a certain amount of ground uh, given the time. Obviously, it is not possible to cover each and every aspect of every subject, uh, but whatever is uh, uh, left aside, uh, you are welcome to ask uh, questions on those aspects, as well as uh, there may be some issues which are related to the subjects which are being discussed here. Uh, so although they may not be directly addressed, but you feel that there is a linkage, there is some uh, connection between those issues and the uh, subjects which are being addressed here, uh, you can even uh, ask questions about those and we'll try our best to provide you satisfactory answers to those. Uh, so uh, uh, once again, I welcome you all uh, and uh, I hope uh, uh, you will find it useful and uh, uh, have all of us benefit from this interaction. Uh, Although we are running a bit late, uh, as mentioned by Akash also, somehow it has become our national habit that uh, we just do not care about punctuality. I was mentioning to someone uh, just last week, uh, we were there at a conference in Moscow and it used to start for two, for two days, it used to start at 8.30 in the morning at minus 20 temperature and uh, everybody would be there at 8.30. And uh, it was a very lengthy uh, uh, conference, 8.30 to 8.30 in the evening. But still, people would be there on time. Uh, 
I thought for a while that instead of uh, asking you people to come at 9, 9.30, let's start at 10.30 or 11. But as our nature is, as I said, it has become a national habit that if we start, uh, give the time at 11, people will start coming at 12, as it generally happens on the various social functions as well. It's not a good thing, but somehow uh, we have developed this habit. And uh, I think uh, as educated people, as uh, people who have got the opportunities to get higher education at the universities, at least uh, we should set an example for others uh, with our behavior. Uh, I have found it uh, uh, myself a number of times that I was invited at some function, some marriage or somewhere, and uh, I went there on the given time and even the hosts were not there. Uh, but then uh, you have to set your own standards. And uh, if uh, uh, most of us start doing it, I think this will probably persuade others also to uh, follow this. Again, uh, one more uh, 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 important uh, aspect. Uh, I am sure everybody uh, is carrying the mobile phone that would be using it. Uh, but my request is to please put them on the silent so that uh, the, our discussion and the sessions are not disturbed. Uh, so you can, uh, while you are doing tweeting or whatever you are doing with the mobile phones, uh, please put them on the side end. But don't let them uh, distract you unnecessarily. Focus on the discussion at hand and while you find time, in fact, there will be breaks also and you will find enough time to use your mobile phones. So I do not want to extend my uh, opening remarks, welcome remarks. Uh, because we are already running uh, a bit late. So we'll try to catch up with the time. So with this, I end my remarks and then hoping again that uh, it will be a fruitful session today as well as tomorrow. And uh, now I uh, hand you over to uh, Dr. Nasset, our Director of Research, uh, for his opening remarks. Thank you. सबसे पहले तो मैं आप सबको मुबारकबाद देना चाहता हूँ कि आप लोगों ने despite what Dr. Salik was saying that we are all here, so let us have the first clap for ourselves. So all the participants should have a clap. अच्छा ये कोई अच्छी आवाज़ नहीं आई मुझे पर तो भी अभी सुबह सुबह थोड़ा सा warm up बहुत जरूरी है तो we can have a second round of clap हाँ जल्दी करो आपको एक अभी एक one pager आपको आएगा six or seven questions please I just say please, and once again please, write down whatever you feel. Don't think of what is politically right or wrong. Don't think, don't try to correct it politically. And if you don't have a problem, then what do we do in the world? Though I don't consider myself old. But I still uh, expect you all that, you know, the young people out there, the energy which you have, try to show that courage. Think out of the box. And, you know, whatever, uh, you, uh, you, you may not agree with anything which we present here. You should have your own views. That is absolutely okay. Okay? one page that you have to give comments comments. So before we start the, uh, our normal sessions, अच्छा एक इंटरेस्टिंग चीज जो आज की इस वर्कशॉप में इस वर्कशॉप में हमने लिया वो ये है कि टुमारो देर इस गोइंग टू बी आफ्टर लंच आर सेशन ऑन स्ट्रेटजिक फोर साइड एंड स्टेरियो प्लानिंग आइजो को पता है शी इज द विक्टिम ऑफ माय डोज लेक्चर्स व्हिच आई यूज्ड टू डिलीवर एट नेशनल डिफेंस यूनिवर्सिटी जो भी रिसर्च आप करना चाहें या आप जो भी स्टडी करना चाहें कोई एनालिसिस करना चाहें उसमें आपको अपनी लाइफ में भी और आपके प्रैक्टिकल लाइफ में भी और आपकी जो एकेडमिक लाइफ है उसमें भी बड़ी हेल्प मिलेगी सो बी प्रिपेयर फॉर द लास्ट सेशन आई कैप्ट इट इंटेंसली एट द एंड सो दैट ये जो आज का सेशन है इसमें ये जो फर्स्ट आपका एक सर्वे है ये इमीडिएटली अटेंड कर लें इसको कम्प्लीट कर लें और उसके बाद देन वी कैन हैव अ मैराथन सेशन ऑफ डॉक्टर सालिक फर्स्ट of two session in line, three hour session. Three hour session ka matlab ye nahi hai ke unho nahi saara contribute karna hai, we will literally, you know, 
डिस्कस आप लोग अपने जो आपके लैब में आइडियाज हैं जैसे डॉक्टर साहब ने कहा कि द ओनली रॉन्ग क्वेश्चन इज द क्वेश्चन विच इज नॉट आस्क जब आप सवाल पूछेंगे नहीं तो वही सबसे गलत सवाल होगा सो आई एक्सपेक्ट यू टू राइट डाउन वट एवर यू फील डोंट एग्री विद एनी थिंग विच इज रिटन हेयर जस्ट जो भी आपके जहन में आता है लिख दें जल्दी से डोंट थिंक टू मच जस्ट हर इट टू इट क्योंकि जल्दी करेंगे तो आपको वो जो आपकी फैकल्टी है और डिस्ट्रेंट वो चैलेंज होगा You can respond to this question. Uh, what are your expectations from this workshop? Anybody, जब आप वहाँ से आ रहे थे, जब से आपने बोल चला, so any one liner we add करना चाहिए हम from any table. Okay, what are your expectations from this workshop? National uh, security dynamics and nuclear strategy, and I think probably also to better understand. Um, I'm sure we have nuclear optimists and nuclear pessimists in the room. So I think hopefully if we can uh, hope that we can find find them, and they they are discovered. So I think uh, understanding that a little better would be very helpful. Okay. you find something uh, which is uh, not uh, given here and which was part of your expectations you could you know raise those in the, in the interactive personal session are you okay complete sir the survey form uh, uh, from this workshop is ke ek to sabse important cheez ye hai ki aap mein se kitne log is kamre mein maujood hain how many are absent sare please raise hand those who are absent ha 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 na most of you are absent let me explain this because hamara jo physical presence hai is not enough theek hai aapke zehen mein ye chal raha hai bahut sare log ye soch rahe hain ki yaar ye kitab phas gaya hai aaj ye dafa lecture maine sunna hai angrezi hai upar se sare usne ye show faculty ne bata diya hai ya pata nahi jo administration ne kisi ne bata diya ya kuch mehrwan aise hain jinko ye khayal hoga ki subah sabere yaar nashta bhi nahi kiya abhi ab let me have a guess most of you mera ye kya hai matlab मैं गलत भी हो सकता हूँ कि आप में से कितने लोगों ने नाश्ता नहीं किया वो प्लीज देते हैं ये मेरी एक असेसमेंट है मतलब ठीक है ना तो अगर आपने नाश्ता ही नहीं किया हुआ बिलीव यू मीन हम तो पुराने लोग हैं हम तो नाश्ता करके आते हैं लेकिन जो नाश्ता नहीं किया आई डोंट एक्सपेक्ट अ वेरी हाई एनर्जी काइंड ऑफ द फर्स्ट सेशन ठीक है तो स्टिल आई मच मस्ट एप्रिशिएट यू कि अगर आप अपनी उस एनर्जी लेवल को जिन्हें क्या हाल है <laughs> ये जो दो तीन विक्टिम ऑफ माय ओल्ड यू नो टाइम्स आर हियर तो तो आप लोग फिजिकली प्रेजेंट हो जाएं व्हाट इज द एविडेंस ऑफ योर प्रेजेंस हियर कोई एविडेंस दे सकते हैं आप योर प्रेजेंस हियर आर यू हियर यस सर हाउ मच 20 30 व्हेन आई से राइट हैंड सो एवरीबॉडी शुड रेज हिज राइट हैंड ठीक है तो मैं आपको भी चेक कर लूंगा कि आप में से कितने लोग यहां पे मौजूद हैं या नहीं ओके प्लीज राइट हैंड अप राइट हैंड अप राइट हैंड राइट हैंड अप राइट हैंड अप लेफ्ट हैंड अप राइट हैंड अप and again right hand up and left hand up physical training left hand up <laughs> okay thank you very much so ye ye ek acha tha aapne sare the yahan pe present ho jaate hain to start thinking uh, of a dream start thinking of a dream ke aap yahan pe bade hi jazbe se aaye i know that it is very difficult you know it's not just money like academically students mein इतना जज्बा पैदा हो जाए तो बड़ा ही मुश्किल है लेकिन आप सोचिए कि जी वो जो थ्री इडियट में बैठा होता था ना आलर खान वो कहता था कि यार आज बड़ा कुछ सीखने को मिलना है क्या है वो थ्री इडियट वाला पता है ना आपको और उसको बड़ा मजा आ रहा है आई वुड लव टू सी दैट एनर्जी इन यू एंड थिंकिंग के यार बड़ा मजा आने वाला है आई एम थिंकिंग यू बिकॉज़ ये बड़े जो रफ से और बड़े ड्राई से सब्जेक्ट्स है ना जो ही आप इनको ग्रैस्प कर लेंगे एंड यू स्टार्ट नोइंग देम यू विल फील एनर्जी इन दैट फिर आपको मजा आना शुरू हो जाएगा आई एम श्योर मोस्ट ऑफ यू आर ऑलरेडी फैमिलियर विद whatever is going to speak here so i wish you and i expect you uh, of from all of you a very good uh, interactive session or man i am very happy that this is a very good strength it is not we are not understand and each one of you who is present here is the most important person here agar aap mein se ek aadmi ne kuch ek lesson bhi yahan se pick karke le gaye so we are successful theek hai so we are happy with that but i am sure we are more in that number most of you will try to take away whatever we are going to say so nothing is correct nothing is wrong so whatever you think is correct put it out usko expose kare just uh, look at it uh, usko practically throw out so dekhenge ki what people uh, say about it so thank you very much so with this kind of a shake up so let's move to the first session so i request uh, dr sanakar uh, do you have anything to say yeah, this is not going to be the formal sort of presentation and then uh, we are going to have a uh, question answer session if you feel like you have something to ask just raise your hand and you can ask right at that moment so
So without further ado, I would like to call um, our director, executive director, SBI, Dr. Neem Sali, to please uh, initiate the first session. Thank you. It has evolved over a period of time, and as uh, Bernard Brody and his wife, Vaughn Brody, wrote a, a very uh, classic book on the evolution of uh, military technology by the title of From the Crossbows to the Hydrogen Bomb. So in, there was a time when crossbow was the most advanced weapon because it gave you the ability to uh, hit your uh, opponent from a distance while remaining yourself safe and how we have advanced from there to uh, the development of hydrogen bomb which can decimate uh, whole cities in a moment. Uh, interestingly, uh, once the nuclear weapons were developed and later on uh, the, these original uh, uh, the weapons which were developed, these were fission bombs or the atomic bombs and the later development led to the thermonuclear bombs or the hydrogen bombs. And somebody asked uh, Winston Churchill as to what is the need for these hydrogen bombs because these fission bombs are powerful enough to destroy the cities and turn them into rubble. He said these weapons will make the rubble bounce. So you don't want to make the rubble bounce. In fact, if they don't make the rubble bounce, but the effect of uh, thermonuclear weapons is such that even bricks and such like uh, uh, material would, all, would sit, simply evaporate. So do you want to do that? So we'll come to that later once we start discussing the uh, nuclear uh, strategy and uh, its implications. But coming to the evolution of uh, military technology over the ages, obviously uh, in one lecture and in this uh, restricted time, we cannot cover everything in this. So I have uh, selected a baseline, which is 1830. So why I have selected 1830 as the baseline? Because 1830 was the year when two major inventions coincided with each other and their combined effect had a uh, great impact on warfare. And these two developments, one was the invention of steam power and the other was the introduction of the uh, telegraph system, electric telegraph system. Prior to this, uh, during the uh, Napoleonic times, the French had introduced what they called the chap telegraph. That was a system based on a series of towers uh, which were uh, established in such a way that one tower was vis visible uh, uh, from the next and it was visible to the next and uh, this way they could communicate through signals, uh, which was basically light signals uh, or with the mirrors. So message would be converted into signals, uh, which were understood by the recipient also. That if there are two flashes, what does it mean? If there is one flash, what does it mean? And there were smaller lights and bigger lights and uh, they all had certain meanings. So the message would be written down, given to one uh, person at the first tower, he would flash it, signal it to the next, he will note it down and then pass it on and this way they could convey the message up to 400 miles in a day. Obviously there were uh, uh, drawbacks in that system because somebody might uh, misinterpret a signal and the message which was originally delivered might be distorted by the time it reaches at the end point. But still it was a great uh, means of communication in those days. But as now we know that instantly you can communicate across the globe. 
uh, in no time. So uh, that is the uh, revolution in communication which has come. However, uh, uh, with the telegraph system and railway, they, why they were uh, important together? Because uh, one could not work with the, uh, with, without the other. The impact of steam railway was that since uh, the date you must remember, 1830, of the 18th century, that is starting from 1790s uh, to 1815, once Napoleon was defeated in the Battle of Waterloo, that was the era of Napoleonic wars in Europe, which had revolutionized the warfare, not because of any technological breakthrough, but because of Napoleon's operational genius. He was a genius in operational strategy, and that genius enabled him to revolutionize warfare, and he was able to defeat all his opponents on the European continent. And before that, just a few years beyond this, you will find the French Revolution, which is a great historical event, uh, which is still considered to be one of the history-changing events in the human history because it brought major changes. First of all, it, it started the process of democratization. Uh, the three principles of French Revolution, liberty, agility, fraternity. And then it uh, allowed, uh, or in fact it imposed what is known as the conscription, general conscription. Prior to that, the military service was confined to the elites in the society. The royalty and the people who are close to royalty and the higher strata of society. But what happened uh, uh, after the French Revolution, that all segments of society, irrespective of this societal status, they got access to the military service. The result was that you had a large reservoir of manpower. Previously, because your uh, choice was limited, so you could not raise large armies. So now you had a large reservoir, you could have people from all strata of society, you could raise large, large armies. The problem then was to how to equip those large armies. And second was how to move them from one place to another. Because it was very cumbersome to move, all movement was basically on foot and on animal transport, which was slow. You could hardly move 15 to 20 miles in a day. And if you have to travel to a, a, a place of battle, which was 200, 300 miles away, it will take you 2-3 weeks. And by the time you reach there, you will be exhausted, tired and not in a good shape. So you need to have good rest before you could be ready to fight. Now all these things were already the, these uh, uh, ingredients of the ability to raise large military forces were there, but with the steam power, it made it possible to equip them also because previously, although industrialization process had started, but all the machines were operated manually. But with steam power, you could uh, run large machines and large factories uh, very conveniently, and you could produce weapons uh, at mass scale. So one, that because of the uh, pattern set by the French Revolution, you could recruit large armies, and you could now also equip them because of the steam power, your manufacturing capabilities multiplied. Now, the third problem was how to move these forces from one point to another. And that problem was solved, solved by the railways. So now with the railway trains, you could carry all these large forces from one point to another over long distances in very short period of time with all their weapons, equipment, bag and baggage, logistic support, everything could be carried in that train. The problem, however, was that in those days, the railway lines were single tracks. And since the railways are moving both ways, uh, there had to be some coordination because there were very few crossing points 
where the trains could cross each other. So they did not want the trains to get stuck at places facing each other where there are no crossing places. So you have to coordinate their movement in a way that they cross each other at the given crossing points. For that you have to have railway timetables. And prior to that there was no standard time at the crossing this point at this time and then they could put conveniently cross. So this solved the problem but it required very meticulous planning. And this planning then uh, also needed a staff, a kind of military bureaucracy, uh, which we now know as the general staff, done in wartime. So the distinction between the peacetime and war got blurred because you were doing all this planning actively during peacetime through these specialists uh, the military bureaucracy or the general service officers who would do all this planning that how many trains will move at what time and how many trains will be coming back and the loading schedules and then unloading. So they will start at one point and they will go to the last railhead, offload their uh, uh, passengers and equipment and then come back. Now to coordinate this movement Telegraph played a very important role. Now this, so we, uh, as apparently it appears that it facilitated the movement and it was a very uh, uh, great facility. But then there are downsides as well. The downside was that there was no flexibility. Because once the railway line is laid, it cannot be moved around. It is static they could not be easily moved around. That was one problem. The other was, once you have laid your railway line in a particular direction, that betrayed your strategic direction beforehand to the enemy. That this is the direction in which you want to move your forces. Germany, France, uh, uh, Austria, others. And Everybody knew that how many days will it take us to move our forces from the inland to the border areas. So, uh, once the crisis developed before the First World War, all countries started moving that so that this, the other should not take an advantage and reach the, to the border areas before us. So, everybody started moving. Uh, precautionary uh, as a precautionary step and preemptively the result was that then everybody came face to face and that is why somebody said uh, European uh, leadership and statesmen by railway timetables started moving uh, doing counter moves and then once they came face to face obviously uh, it led to the conflict ultimately so this was the impact of railway and telegraph. So one of uh, the shortcomings I have uh, told you already, flexibility, inflexibility and uh, giving out your strategic direction beforehand. Rail had to another, but from the rail had where you offloaded all this, you had to carry to the battlefield and there was no means of transportation there because there was no motor transport at that time available could not operate uh, at, for a distance uh, beyond 25 kilometers to 35 kilometers from the last railhead. And then they had to carry all this material from the railhead, dump it on the battlefield. Once they have dumped it, that created its own problems because you had ground rations as well. So if you had to advance from there, you will have to stop at some stage and then carry forward those flies further to wherever you had gone. And if you are forced to withdraw from there, then you lost everything there because you could not hurriedly carry it back with you. And that would be lost. And as well as the second hour of the 19th century. And some of these were previously, if you have seen old war movies you will see that uh, people would put gunpowder in the muskets and they used to be steel balls, they would uh, load into those and they were loaded from the front end. So they will uh, uh, put the, uh, the projectile in 
and then put the uh, gunpowder and and then uh, uh, ignite it, which will force the projectile away. Since they were round in shape, they won't go very far. And then every time uh, you have fired a shot with a musket, you have to pull it back, load it, and then again take the aim. So that will waste a lot of time. So this was what we call the muzzle loading weapons. And retaking the aim, the weapon would stay there, you fire one bullet, then load another one and fire. So that increased the number of bullets you could fire in a minute. Which meant that you could fire more bullets. Second was the introduction of the cylindro-conical bullets. The bullets, as you know these days, they are conical in shape, which has got better ability and wet, and they won't ignite. So they also introduced than the copper uh, cartridges. So copper cartridges, cylindrical bullets, and breech loading, all these things combined together greatly increase the rate of fire. Not only rate of fire, but accuracy and range of weapons. So you could hit farther, more accurately, and at a rapid rate. The result was that you could bring to bear on the battlefield greater volume of fire, more lethal, more accurate, and at a greater distance. Previously, you would have seen that the soldiers would line up on the battlefield in straight line, uh, raise their muskets, and on the order by the commander, they will fire, then pull back, reload, and fire. With this, increasing accuracy and lethality of weapons, it became uh, difficult to stand on the battlefield and fire. So, what happened? There were instinctive reactions by the soldiers, because once they were faced with this lethal fire, they looked for whatever cover was available on the field and ducked down behind it where it was a bush or some dip in the ground or something. But everywhere this kind of cover was not available for everyone. So then they introduced the digging tools as part of the soldier's kit. So the uh, shovel became, uh, or spade or shovel, whatever you call it, became as important as the rifle for the soldiers because his survival depended on it. So wherever the natural cover was not available, they would dig a trench and protect themselves against the incoming fire. The second thing was that because of the accuracy and long range of weapons, uh, if you were visible, you could be shot. So then people looked at, and if you have seen old movies, classical movies, you would have seen that pe people used to wear very colorful uniforms. Red and uh, blue and green and all those yellow, all those kind of colors. But those colors are very visible. So then this was also changed into dull drab colors like khaki and olive green and now we have uh, these camouflage uniforms which uh, help you uh, merge with the background. It gives you camouflage and conceals you so that you cannot be seen easily by the enemy and cannot be hit. Related to this was the headgear. People used to wear hats, very fancy hats with plumes and all those kind of things, uh, which again were useless against this effective fire. So what uh, 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 they did was that they introduced the steel helmet to protect yourself from the incoming bullets. Previously, soldiers uh, detested wearing uh, steel helmet. They looked down upon it uh, because this was uh, the symbol of mining workers and labor class. And soldiers 
uh, thing thought of themselves as elitist. So they didn't want to wear something which was associated with the laborers and the miners. But then they were forced to do that. So these were the changes which brought up in this style of warfare. Again, if you uh, attack uh, in close formations, shoulder to shoulder with each other, uh, the chances of more people getting hit uh, were far greater. So therefore, uh, people started dispersing, having greater distance from soldier to soldier. Uh, if they were shoulder to shoulder, then they initially uh, 1 to 2 meters, then 5 meters, 10 meters, and then increase further. So uh, you were staggered, dispersed, and also uh, instead of attacking in one go, you would rush from one cover to another, and then the other party would follow you. They will go up to the next stage, and then you will get up and go to the next stage. So in this leapfrogging manner, the, uh, the style of attack also changed. In terms of field artillery guns, the problem was that, uh, again, uh, the front loading to breech loading, but then the problem was that once the artillery guns were fired, because of the backlash of the shell uh, uh, leaving the barrel, the gun will jump back uh, many feet. So you have to bring it back to the firing position and then fire it. So there was one invention which was called uh, the, what you call the, uh, cannon. 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 not cannon, anybody, recoil mechanism. Recoil mechanism is something uh, it's like shock absorbers in your vehicles. So the coil mechanism, uh, once it was introduced into the guns, once the barrel was pushed back as a reaction to the shell going out, uh, the shock was absorbed by the that spring mechanism, that cushion provided by the recoil mechanism. So gun stayed at its place while the barrel moved and its backward movement was cushioned by the recoil mechanism, which would then gradually push it back into position. So only barrel will move up and down, but the gun will stay static at its position. That also helped in increasing the rate of fire. Then came the, uh, I am sure all of you must be familiar with the American Civil War, which was fought between 1861 to 1865. And that was uh, the first major war of the Industrial Revolution. By that time, the machine guns had also been introduced, which had a much greater rate of fire. And along with that, uh, this digging tools, so there was series of trenches covering whole towns and cities, all the defenses around those major towns, going back and forth between the confederates and the unionists. And secondly, uh, again a phenomenon of industrialization that they were able to produce barbed wire at, in large quantities. So the defenses, the trenches which were dug, uh, they had machine guns and then further protected by the layers of barbed wire in front, which could uh, hinder the movement of attackers on the defensive positions. So as a result, the defense got a boost and it was uh, very difficult to, uh, what they said, overcome the trinity of machine gun. Uh, digging tool and the barbed wire. So these three things combined make it very difficult to assault a position because uh, it was became very, very costly in terms of casualties. However, uh, uh, this lesson, the lessons from the American Civil War were not learned well by the Europeans because this was something happening 
in a distant area and obviously those days there were no satellite lanes people could not see it on cnn or bbc or on the social media uh, so no one knew what is happening there the reports were coming but obviously you could not uh, really absorb it closer to home to the europeans in 1866 there was this war between austria and prussia prussia at that time as you know germany was not there Prussia was one of the major German states, so there was this war between Austria and Prussia in 1866, in which, uh, because of the uh, superior mobility of their railway system, and uh, the second thing which had the Prussians to win was the needle gun, uh, which they had introduced. It, it had a much greater rate of fire. compared with the weapons which were being used by the austrians but it was a mobile warfare it was not static warfare uh, fought in the trenches with the barbed wire like in the american civil war the second uh, uh, major uh, uh, conflict was in europe between germany and or prussia and france in 1870 71 in which again uh, the Uh, Prussians they prevailed, and this has got a very interesting uh, 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 end result. That once the French were defeated, they were made to sign a treaty surrender uh, document at a place called Versailles, and Versailles is in the outskirts of Paris, uh, where they have their palaces, old palaces, uh, beautiful place. so that was the place where the uh, surrender do documents were signed by the french and later on uh, at the end of the first world war uh, once the germans were defeated in the first world war they were brought to versailles and made to sign the surrender uh, uh, documents there by the french so he history literally repeating itself and that famous treaty of versailles which imposed lot of restrictions on germany so this is how things uh, uh, proceeded up to the uh, first world war <clears throat> now during the austro prussian war uh, they calculated at the end of the war that during 8 weeks of this war uh, on the average or german artillery guns had fired 200 rounds per gun on the average during 8 weeks of conflict so based on that uh, they had built stocks of 1000 rounds per gun thinking that this will last for few months that is why they say that uh, the army is prepared to fight the last war because whatever uh, data whatever information you Uh, get from the previous conflict you build your stock based on that so uh, they built started the first world war with 1000 rounds per gun stocks but because of the high intensity of battles and the higher rate of guns by that time all this ammunition was exhausted in 4 to 5 weeks and then they had to wait for the production to gear up or uh, to provide uh, the the guns the uh, requisite ammunition to continue with the operations so uh, while the high rate of fire gives you advantage uh, give you more effectiveness on the battlefield it has the associated problem that it creates logistic problems because then the supply chain has to be very effective and Uh, and geared up to provide you the material uh, during the first world war the german army was spending 300 million uh, bullets per month and imagine carrying all that ammunition forward to replenish the ammunition which was being consumed uh, in addition to the artillery uh, ammunition and all other spares and maintenance uh, material so uh, it was a colossal effort which was required 
the problem during the First World War, then uh, uh, once it started, it, as you know, it turned into a stalemate situation with line of trenches from Atlantic to the, uh, the English uh, ch Channel. And it turned into a trench warfare which continued for four, four years, where there were a lot of casualties and in fact, it was a miserable uh, uh, environment for soldiers living all on those trenches where there would be uh, rain and snow and then the different uh, extreme weathers. There will be slush inside and then maintaining hygiene in those conditions, supplying food there, surviving there and all the time there is utterly shelling and noise and how do you uh, rest yourself. So it was a, a very terrible uh, situation. But the problem was, why stalemate was caused was that uh, once you advance up to a level, uh, initially you could have all these flies at the last railhead, carry them and move. Once you have moved, let's say 20 miles or 30 miles ahead, then your flies will be offloaded at the last railway station and from there it had to be carried forward. By that time, by the time of uh, First World War, these motor vehicles had come up. But then in the battlefield, there are, there are no, not many roads. And because of heavy utterly shelling, uh, all this area was cratered. So it was very difficult to move those vehicles. So by the time in those broken and uh, uh, those cratered areas, once these vehicles will bring up supplies, uh, you would have to wait for that to come and it will take some time. The second problem was of communication. Now, up to the last railhead, you had telegraph. So the control of the battle from the capital became easier up to the core headquarter level or the higher headquarters. But from the uh, divisional headquarter or core headquarter to the actual battalion and brigade fighting on the battlefield, uh, there was no similar means of communication and these portable wireless sets were not there. The walkie talkies were not there. And the wireless sets in those days were too heavy and cumbersome to be carried on the back. So the only means of communication over the battlefield was the wire telephone wire, field telephones. So once you advance, then the wire was, was, wire followed you. And by the time wire reached you, you were out of communication. And if you wanted some immediate reinforcement to carry forward your attack or to strengthen your defense, you could not immediately send the message because you had to wait for the uh, telephone cable to reach you. And then the telephone cable was also vulnerable because it would be cut by the enemy action, it would be cut by the utterly shells, and communication will go off. So that these were the big problems. And uh, learning lesson from uh, the First World War, once the machine gun and trenches and the barbed wire combination of all these things, uh, brought the battle to the standstill, the uh, solution which came up was a technological solution. And that was in the form of tank, which made its appearance in 1916. The earlier tanks, uh, they were obviously, uh, the machines were not very reliable, they did not have much speed. Uh, but they would protect you from machine gun fire and they could help you overcome the trenches. But they could not go very far and there would be frequent uh, mechanical breakdowns, but it made an impact and people thought that now we have a solution which can uh, lead us through the battle. But as you would realize, uh, it always happens that whenever you have something which in immediately gives you an impression that now everything has changed, 
very soon after people start looking for antidotes to that and they learned how to manage that and it wasn't long before uh, anti-tank guns were developed so tank did not have a free run uh, they could be uh, hit by the anti-tank guns and now we know the anti-tank guided missiles which are very lethal and the drones and all those kind of weapons. So remember one thing that whenever a te technological advancement ha happens, initially there is a lot of excitement that now everything is going to change. But that is a very transitory period. It then gives way to uh, people learning how to manage it and also <laughs> developing antidotes to that. Once the aircraft came, people thought that now there is nothing you can do against it. And now you have all kinds of surface-to-air missiles and anti-aircraft guns and a lot of defenses against the aircraft. So it keeps happening. Uh, and that pattern will continue once we come to the uh, modern technologies, you will uh, realize that. Uh, we have to look at them in this uh, background and this perspective. So during the Second World War, then the tank had advanced by that time, and uh, the famous blitz screen battles, which uh, initially made an impact, but then people found answers to that, as we found in the uh, battle between the Russians and the Germans on the Eastern Front. And the, those were the real battles, actually. Uh, if you know that uh, the Germans attacked Russia with 150 divisions, uh, consisting of three, 3 million soldiers. And the Russians opposed them with 200 divisions, consisting of 4.5 million soldiers. So you can well imagine. Uh, thousands of guns, thousands of tanks, and uh, all kinds of uh, weapon systems, aircraft, everything. So those were the major battles. Uh, those blitzkrieg battles, but after a couple of years, we found that once the Soviets, they started counter-attacking the Germans, they were able to push them back. And they, they had found answers to the blitzkrieg also. End of the first war, uh, a world war in 1918 and the beginning of the Second World War in 1939, these 20 years, uh, there were a lot of experiments being carried out uh, uh, in tank warfare and uh, the technology also developed. The Germans, uh, because of the terms of Treaty of Versailles, were not supposed to have tanks, but they had developed tanks and they could not, obviously, that openly. Uh, train uh, on those tanks and carry out exercises and maneuvers. So they had an agreement with uh, Russia and took their tanks into Russia, the Russians themselves. So these are the ironies of history. Automation. More and more automation, uh, Prussian guiding, Prussian guidance, uh, uh, which has increased the accuracy of uh, weapons. A lot of improvements in communication and intelligence because of satellites and all those other technological means of gathering intelligence. Uh, previously, they said that the ability of a commander lies in his vision, in his ability to visualize what is on the other side of the hill. So if you have a hill in front, and you have no means of looking over it. You have satellites on top, uh, uh, the, these Google Maps and everything, which gives you uh, real-time information, uh, G G GPS and all those kind of things. So the trend towards automation has uh, gone on. And uh, towards the end of uh, my talk, I will then cover the futuristic technologies which are now around the horizon. It used to be sailing ships with those big sails 
and ships were made of wood. The structures of ships were made of wood and they would move in on the oceans uh, with the help of wind uh, with the sails. And their speed and direction obviously would be dependent on the speed and direction of the wind. However, one advantage of that was that the sailing ships did not have to come back to their ports for refueling or repair maintenance. So they could get, stay on the uh, uh, seas uh, indefinitely. And interestingly, uh, with the sailing ships, larger ships could have greater speed because their sails were bigger. They could catch more wind and they could gain more speed compared to smaller ships. And they had cannons on top uh, with which they would hit the opposing ships, but the limit range of cannons was limited. They also used to have uh, a kind of thing, as, um, you must have seen these rhinos, they have this horn. So that kind of thing uh, uh, they had ships and because they were wooden in structure they would come close to each other and hit each other and uh, uh, create a hole which would be filled with water and damage it. And you would also seen in those old war movies that the ships, sailing ships coming close to each other, firing with muskets at each other, in fact throwing ropes at them, physically assaulting the other ship and killing the people because uh, of the short range of the weapons. They could come close and fight. Once the steam uh, power came, that also helped the ships. And instead of the sailing ships, you could have the, now the steam engines in the ships, uh, which helped building of larger ships, which could carry greater weight. But now uh, the difference was that smaller ships could move faster than the larger ships. The second thing was that their staying power on the seas was limited because uh, there was a limited number of uh, volume of fuel they could store because steam power was generated by burning coal and uh, you could have a limited quantity of coal on the ship once it is all burned up so you have to either go back to your port to refuel or you needed to have friendly ports or ports which were under your control overseas. So that compulsion led to the uh, race for colonization because all the major parts that wanted to have colonies so that once their navies are moving they could go there for uh, refueling and repair maintenance and uh, get the uh, required fuel from there. So that led to the colonization campaign. On the other hand, uh, once the uh, improvement happened on the uh, in the cannons on the on the land, those same cannons were then transferred to the ships. And with the longer range and more accurate fire, it became very difficult for the wooden ships to. Uh, stand the fire of accurate fire of those guns. So then they, they started initially the st wooden structures they were covered with a sheet of iron from outside to give them a certain degree of protection against the artillery shells coming up and these kind of ships were called iron clads and these were first used in the American Civil War. And there was a famous uh, uh, incident between a ship, ironclad ship of the Confederates versus ironclad ship of the Unionists and they kept on firing artillery shells on each other. None of those could penetrate the, that iron sheet and they were deflected from there. Uh, so it ended in a draw. But this ironclad ship's uh, era was very brief. Just uh, uh, 
uh, stayed for a few years and then people started building uh, the whole ships of, of, with iron and steel. Uh, which meant that the, you could build larger ships uh, and you could also then uh, put on them heavier cannons. But the cannons became so heavy that they were 30 to 60 tons weight and obviously they could not be manually operated so there were steam powered turrets with which those cannons were operated. But with the result that the longer range and heavier shells of those cannons the naval bat battle, the distance between the ships increased, they would now uh, be positioned at a distance from each other and shooting at each other from a distance. And anyone having a longer range <coughs> a cannon would be able to uh, uh, hit the opponent ships from a distance while remaining safe. <coughs> and later on from steam power, uh, the, the ships were converted to the oil uh, or these uh, internal combustion engines based on uh, this diesel or uh, petrol and that also then needed to have control over the uh, uh, the areas where oil was produced like Middle East and other countries. So then they started uh, focusing their attention and uh, having control over these oil producing areas. Then uh, 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 what happened was that once the air power also came up, uh, if there was a battle close to the shores, the aircraft would take off and then uh, bomb the ships. And unless the decks were very strong, uh, the, those, 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 those would be damaged by the bombing, the engine bombing. So it became more and more difficult. Then they started, uh, because obviously the shore-based aircraft had a limited range, so they started carrying aircraft on the top of top deck of the ships. So they had these flat deck ships on uh, the earlier version of the modern aircraft carriers. So they had aircraft uh, like you would have seen some aircraft flying which have a boat underneath. So they can run on water also then they can take off. So they can land on water and take off from water. So what they would do is that they would pick up the aircraft with the crane, haul it down on the water, then it would take off from there, land there and again pick it up and put it back on the uh, deck of the ship. So that was the initial version of the uh, aircraft carrier. And later on we have seen during the second world war and now uh, all Navy is now around, built around aircraft carriers, particularly those countries which have uh, blue water navies or uh, navies which dominate uh, globally. Because aircraft now cannot, uh, the ships can now not survive without their integral air component. And that is why now the naval engagements take place without the admiral seeing the ships of the opposite side. They may be 500 miles or 1000 miles away and the aircraft, reconnaissance aircraft would pick them up, go and attack them and destroy them without the ships coming across each other. The third dimension uh, 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 which was introduced in the uh, naval warfare was the submarine. Now uh, people had ideas about the submarine right from the days of the American War of Independence in 1780s and later on uh, one submarine was experimented with uh, during the American Civil War. It uh, dipped down and never came up and then uh, uh, a submarine was uh, offered to, uh, uh, presented to Napoleon also uh, that earlier prototype but he didn't show much interest in that. So there was not much development. The problem with the submarine was that uh, the idea was there, but uh, requisite technology was not there. Because submarine had to not only move over surface, it also had to move underwater. While over the surface it could run with an internal combustion or petrol diesel engine, uh, usually diesel engine, which requires suction of oxygen from the air. Once it 
goes under water, then that oxygen is not available. So that internal combustion engine does not work. So how to then propel the submarine under water? So people could not find an answer. And finally, the answer found was that it should have twin engines. One diesel uh, engine, uh, which would help it run on the surface, and one electric engine, which would help it move under the water. And with these two engines, then uh, once the batteries would run out, it would have to surface, start its diesel engine, charge the batteries, and could go down again. And now we have the nuclear powered submarines. We do not have to charge their batteries or come or surface to charge their batteries. They can stay under water indefinitely because they are run on nuclear power. Just like medium there. So then uh, they found the answer in form of a compressed air weapon in the form of torpedo. Uh, initially, the range of torpedo was up to one kilometer. It has increased now to uh, several kilometers and uh, more and more. In fact, there are nuclear tip torpedoes as well. Uh, so the submarine became a, a very potent weapon. Uh, it could provide threat to the uh, ships uh, from another dimension. Uh, it's difficult to detect a submerged submarine, but then people have uh, devised technologies for that as well. For instance, uh, as we know, electromagnetic waves do not travel under water. So it's difficult to communicate uh, mm -hmm. uh, with the uh, submarine once it is under water and also uh, how to uh, use your uh, means of detection uh, to detect a submarine. The only thing which moves easily under water is the sound waves. So, the instrument which they devised to detect the submarine is called the sonar. So, uh, this is, there are two types of these uh, equipment. One is active sonar, other is passive sonar. The active sonar sends out sound signals. Uh, the, these are, these are uh, dipped in water, hanging from the side of the ship. And they send out sound uh, waves, which go and hit a submarine and reflect back, they are detected and you find out that there is some object there. The other is passive sonar, which does not send out waves, but it just receives uh, the sound waves which are being generated by the movement of the submarine itself. It has limited range, but then it is safer because once you are actively sending out signals uh, to detect a submarine, the submarine can also detect you and can hit you before you can hit it. So these are uh, in very brief about developments of technology in the naval warfare. Now you have all kinds of missiles on top of uh, ships. You have uh, those long range maritime aircraft. You have long range drones which operate from the aircraft and uh, provide you surveillance. So all these developments have taken place. Now coming over to the air warfare. Now, air uh, uh, arm is the youngest of all the forces. Land warfare is the oldest, then the nav naval, and then the air arm. Uh, the beginning of the air power started in the form of hot air balloons. These balloons were uh, hoisted. Uh, they were anchored with a rope with the ground. They would raise up. 50, 100 meters, 150 meters, and they were used basically to provide long range observation. Because if you are on a battlefield, you could not see very far, and with these balloons carrying uh, one or two observers there, they could go up and see to a greater distance. They were also used for directing the fire of long range artillery because they could see targets which a ground observer could not see. Uh, the problem was these, uh, uh, the movement of, of these balloons could not be controlled. So they had to be anchored with the ropes. So they would be raised up and pulled down. Later on, uh, the more advanced version of these balloons came up 
which were known as the dirigibles, which could be steered. So those would not be anchored with the rope, they could just go up and start moving in the desired direction and they had the ability to be uh, turned around where in which whatever direction you wanted and they could come back. And those were known as the airships. Later on you say, saw much bigger airships which were even used for carrying passengers. Uh, so the air transport initially started with the hot air balloons. And during Napoleon's time, one artist depicted the potential of hot air balloons by making uh, sketches or pictures of hot air balloons, large hot air balloons going across the English Channel carrying utterly guns and horses and soldiers across the English Channel and attacking the British island. But in practice it did not happen. Uh, these just remained ideas. Ultimately, in the early 20th century, uh, the Wright brother, brothers, as we all know, they carried out successful employment, uh, this uh, uh, flight uh, of the aircraft. Uh, previously, it was thought that heavier than air machines cannot fly, but they were able to demonstrate it. Uh, before that, there was uh, another American by the name of Langley. He was given funding for this project by the American Congress. And just nine days before the successful experiment of the Wright brothers, uh, Langley had a flight which failed. And result of that, the Congress stopped the funding. And just uh, nine, ten days after that, the Wright brothers successfully demonstrated the flight. But then, by that time, the American Congress had lost interest and stopped the funding. The result was that then the development in near power uh, the focus shifted to Europe and countries like Italy then became the leaders in this field. And Italy was the first power which used air, air power uh, in battle uh, in its campaign in Libya and Ethiopia in 1911-1912. By the time the First World War came, there were about 500 ships uh, with all the uh, sides and once the war ended, uh, the number of ships was in thousands. But these were old biplanes made of wood basically with no weapons. Uh, so what they did was that they would just, they attempted throwing uh, explosives from the air and they were used for carrying uh, liaison officers, they were used for providing long range observation, reconnaissance of enemy positions and directing utterly fire initially. And once all sides started flying aircraft, they would come across each other in the air. But since they did not have the weapons like the modern aircraft, so the pilots would take out pistols fr uh, from their side and shoot at each other uh, with the pistols. So, so that was an interesting uh, uh, time uh, in the aerial uh, warfare, dog fights. And by the end of the war, uh, uh, for instance, the number of airmen in uh, Britain alone had uh, uh, gone up to 300,000. And they had thousands of uh, aircraft. And since this was a very adventurous kind of technology, so a lot of youngsters educated from uh, good family backgrounds, they got interested in this. So this became uh, a heroic thing and uh, People used to take a lot of pride in uh, being uh, the flyers as they do today. Uh, so uh, this air park continued to develop in the uh, interwar years. During that time, uh, people like uh, uh, Italian uh, Duhe and uh, American Mitchell and then uh, Siversky of Russia, those kind of people's air warfare tourists they suggested after the First World War that this slogging match on ground which is very slow and ponderous and results in large scale casualties can be avoided with the air power. So the air power they thought would be uh, playing a decisive role in future wars by directly attacking 
there was no obstacle for the air power, no river, no canal, no uh, hill could stop them. They could fly over the obstacles, go right to the uh, heartland of the enemy, strike their population centers and break their will to fight. And they would surrender while their land forces were still intact on the borders. But that did not happen because technology had not advanced to that extent by that time. So at the beginning of the Second World War, there were far more advanced aircraft and both different countries developed aircraft depending on their own outlook. For Germans, uh, the support of land operations were more important. Uh, so whenever they carried out those blitzkrieg operations with tank armies, these were preceded by uh, Stuka bombers, dive bombers of Germans, uh, who uh, softened up the enemy before the tanks advanced. Whereas the British, uh, particularly, once the Germans started attacking the uh, British in that famous Battle of Britain, after they had uh, defeated France, the British developed, focused more on interceptors and fighters, which could fight off the German bombers which were coming in waves to attack uh, major uh, British towns and cities. And then they started concentrating on bombers and once the Americans also came in, then they started carrying out carpet bombing and what was called in those days strategic bombing of cities like Dresden and Hamburg and uh, Munich and other Berlin uh, uh, in Germany, but that did not uh, interestingly break the will to fight. Despite all this heavy bombing, uh, it was interesting to note this bombing instead of breaking the will, it hardened the will. So it's very difficult to predict the human psyche. However, one development changed the whole uh, environment and that was the invention of the atomic bombs. Wherein one aircraft carrying one bomb to decimate a city in no time. And that is where the fire part for the first time gained a, a very clear ascendancy. Actually. So now then towards the end, uh, they also found that if you send the bombers uh, to attack the targets, they'll be susceptible to the interceptors and fighters. So then they started sending fighter escorts with the uh, bombers. The result was that it became very difficult to coordinate because both the machines had different flying characteristics, different speeds, so to coordinate their movement was not so easy. Night bombing was very difficult because night vehicle devices were not there and if you went during day you were subjected to the anti-aircraft fire as well as the enemy interceptors. Then a uh, new development was what we know today as the fighter bombers. These aircraft combine both elements. They can bomb, although they cannot carry as much payload as the uh, purpose-built bombers, but they also have the ability to fight back. So the fighter bombers are now the trend uh, in the modern times. It has uh, impacted the way the war is conducted. Just if uh, brief now recap of uh, the futuristic uh, what potential is there in the emerging technologies like uh, artificial intelligence, uh, the uh, quantum computing, the machine learning and then the drone swarms and all these things which are coming up. So they have created a lot of commotion that they are going to change the warfare forever. You will find that this technology will also be managed in time and their counters will also be developed. As we have already seen that a lot of drones have been shot down successfully by the Ukrainians in the Russia-Ukraine conflict and Russians have also shot down the Ukrainian drones uh, with the help of laser guns, the drones which are coming to attack. Uh, so there will be counters developed with them and these technologies uh, will be managed in the future because they will mature in 10, 20, 25 years time. 
by that time a lot of things change and many of the technologies as we have experienced in the past do not live up to the expectations so theoretically they, they have, there are shortcomings which people identify and then counter those so this is what is going to happen the problem is that uh, the autonomous lethal autonomous weapons the ai how it is going to impact the command and control and the ethics of war because the problem is now the humans can control the weapons and the man you see an old man a soldier will think twice before shooting but a robot uh, machine gun will only do these uh, uh, drone swarms currently most of the drones are controlled by the land based operators but once that operator goes away and the drone swarms which uh, uh, go independently the loitering munitions and all those kind of varieties of drones, that these are human operator controlling the movement of these uh, machines the other is human on the loop that a human is not interfering or not controlling the movement of these machines but is closely observing and has the ability to interfere at any stage when it wants the once you have launched these machines then the human does not or cannot interfere with that uh, how it operates and what how it uh, uh, selects its target how it engages it so that is where the danger comes and there are negotiation going on in geneva uh, to bring to some kind of regulation this lethal autonomous weapons but so far there is not much progress because only few countries have access to these technologies and they would not like to accept any restrictions as long as they have an advantage in these so it will only be once these become more widespread that they probably will be more agreeable to accept some kind of international regulations and controls and some kinds of sops to uh, regulate their use so that is where uh, the these uh, technologies stand uh, they are disruptive and uh, destabilizing because uh, with the micro satellites and the drones uh, the mobile missile launchers which provided a kind of security against a preemptive surprise strike uh, will go away because there is so much of data coming in through satellites to other means of communication and intelligence that it's humanly impossible to uh, analyze and sift that data so it is through quantum computing and artificial intelligence this data can be very quickly processed and it can give you uh, options uh, alternatives uh, options to uh, act on so as long as those options are given and the human is there to select one of those options it is good enough it will be helpful but if human goes out and they themselves decide on what action to take that will be dangerous so i i think uh, it was a very intensive uh, lecture but i tried to made it as simple as possible i hope uh, uh, you will have a lot of questions but i think uh, i also need a break and you also need a break have your tea and then we can have the question and answer Uh, we started off with this. Uh, this is not going to be a lecture kind of a series. ठीक है? ये एक discussion है. आप लोगों की चाय भी पिएं. चाय हमने इसलिए जानबूझ के यहाँ पे अंदर ही मंगवा ली है. Keep thinking and keep talking. Uh, एक तो सबसे पहले मजे की बात ये है कि we are different universities हैं. ठीक है? I would uh, suggest कि अगला जो आपका live session होगा, don't sit on your own table. Sit on the table of some other university. आगे एक बहुत सी discussion. आपस में ना इंट्रा यूनिवर्सिटी भी डिस्कशन करने के लिए अच्छा एक क्वेश्चन मैं आपसे पूछने जाता हूं डॉक्टर साहब की इजाजत से वो ये है कि हाउ मेनी ऑफ यू बिलीव दैट द वेपन्स आर द सोर्स ऑफ वॉर अगर वेपन एक चुटकी बजाई जाए और वापस गायब हो जाए तो विल द ह्यूमन बीइंग दे विल कंटिन्यू फाइटिंग और देयर बी नो मोर वॉर कंटिन्यू फाइटिंग चलो लेट सी एनीबॉडी एनीबॉडी वांट्स टू हैव अ आप बताइए यस So will it uh, help in eliminating war? Yeah, war will continue. Yes, sir. Yeah. I think that's the balance of power. They don't actually escalate 
you can continue pursuing realist uh, ideologies, but must have the understanding out of what the parallel perspectives are, what are the other perspectives are. The uh, colonialism talk. How many of you love colonialism? No. Yes. How many of you love colonialism? I love imperialism. Imperialism. Do you love? Do you cherish the memories of the colonialism? Not the memories of colonialism. Anyone who is proud of the history of the colonial rule? Share some of the features of the colonialism. Why I want to shatter your basic belief that they have no way lies here now, please think, please start thinking. These are the books that are written in the books, these are the books that are written in the books. These are the books that are written in the books. This is the purpose of the discussion that you have to ask here, start thinking. The first thing is question the given. What is given is not right. What is given is not the absolute truth. Is it absolute truth? That man is selfish by nature? No. Man can cooperate also. Sometimes he can cooperate and sometimes he behaves selfishly. Is it possible? So man can cooperate but for his self-interest. Self-interest is a big thing. Why a soldier sacrifices his life? What he gets in return? What does he mean? Who will die? 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 The reward of the sacrifice of the Shahadat. What does he get there? Why is he motivated and keeps running and gets killed? Because the story is not the story. The story is not the story. But this is a story. What immediately does he get there? Higher principles. ये जो आपने शुरू में कहा ना ये रॉल कनेक्टेड ये रॉल कनेक्टेड जो ट्राइबल सोसाइटी थी ना पुरानी इंसानों की उसमें जब लड़ाई होती तो सब इकट्ठे हो जाते थे बिकॉज़ दैट इस हाउ द सर्वाइवल नेचर है वी कम टुगेदर टू प्रोटेक्ट इच अदर अगर आप वो जो इकट्ठे हो के लड़ना था वो क्यों लड़ते अगर आपके पास इस वक्त इस कमरे में अगर कोई एक वेपन लेके आ जाए, do we all start feeling a threat from? पहले इसका मतलब है कि लोगों का पहले से एक्वाइज़र टेस्ट होती है फिल्मों में इसका ये आप कह रहे हैं कि आम लाइसेंस है कि हर बार भी कोई नहीं मिलना चाहिए उसका एक्वाइज़र टेस्ट होने के लिए फिर उस जगह के कितने आप पॉलिसी की बातें कर रहे हैं टॉपिक ऑफ़ पॉलिस अच्छा भी आई आई वांट टू � the more power you get, the more security you have. Do we all need security? Our, our security is always threatened. No? Do you have to do it? different on security. Security is different. But primary security is what we have to do. The first thing is the knowledge of the knowledge. And the knowledge of the knowledge, you have to say, that if you eat food, then you have to eat food. That's the basic thing. What is your basic? फूड है, शर्ट है, क्लोथिंग है, बेसिक नीड्स जो नियाजी जरूरी आते हैं। रोटी पकोड़ा और मकान। तो क्या रोटी कपड़ा और मकान आपको मिल जाए तो विल यू बी सेटिस्फाइड? अच्छा ये जो थोड़ा सा शेकिंग किया आपने चाय भी पी लिया थोड़ी सी आपको थोड़ा सा समझ आ गया कि ये रेलेज़म इस नॉट
more easily and more readily available now. But even in uh, those times, once the written word was available, the printing press as you mentioned, uh, the things were put on paper, then these could be circulated, these were translated in different languages and there was this cross, uh, uh, you say, say pollination of ideas. The, uh, uh, what they call the apostles of tank warfare were Little Heart and Fuller. But their ideas were uh, more uh, popular in Germany as compared to their own country, Britain. Uh, similarly, uh, the ideas of different uh, uh, air power theorists and others, uh, they were borrowed by others and adapted to their uh, own uh, environment. Uh, so, uh, and uh, also remember that an idea cannot, can never be destroyed. An idea, once it is generated, it cannot be destroyed. Whether you like it or not, communism is an idea. It's not uh, dominant in the world of, of today, but it is not that as an idea. You cannot scratch it away from the memories or from the history books. It might make a comeback in future. Similarly, fascism. Uh, people thought it is a dead idea after the uh, defeat of Mussolini in Italy and others. But we have seen that it keeps making a comeback. So ideas uh, transfer from uh, one era to the other and one able, <coughs> although it sometimes uh, sounds surprising that you find a lot of commonality in the ideas of Sun Tzu who lived in uh, 4th century BC and uh, Kotilia who was 
uh, in 3rd and 4th century BC in India, they, they, they lived in different societies, uh, different languages, uh, with no means of communication across the Himalayas except those trade caravans probably. But still you find commonality in their ideas, you find uh, those ideas repeated in uh, Machiavelli also and uh, the ideas keep back and forth. It's very difficult to trace sometimes how they were transmitted from one society to the other. A society with very different kinds of structures, very different kind of uh, languages and cultures, how those ideas could be picked up by the other societies. But it does happen. And uh, particularly it is now much easier uh, because everything is instantly available. The Americans issue their national security strategy and second day you find uh, comments on that and analyses around the world. And then the others adjust their policies accordingly and uh, see what, what they are trying to uh, send as a message in that document. Uh, similarly, once the Chinese issues their defense white paper or the Russians talk of their uh, strategy, so it is taken note of by people around the world. So this is how it happens. Yes. where uh, humans will be able to observe, but they have the capacity to intervene if they want. I think fundamentally this would be a question of if the if an individual has to decide whether or not, or even when they wish to intervene, it would be about how far they trust that artificial intelligence, that capacity to actually function or move forward the way that it should. Do you think it's possible to bridge the gap between allowing that artificial intelligence to continue carry, uh, to carry on as it should, as it's been instructed, and the how much trust can an individual actually place in that weapon, which would prevent them from intervening? Uh, its output is dependent on the data set on which it works. It has to have the reference point. So, uh, for instance, uh, if the facial recognition uh, software, which is available now in the form of artificial intelligence, it has to be fed different features, characteristics of different human beings, only then it can identify. If it, it cannot compare, like uh, the uh, fingerprints, if you do not have record of fingerprints and, sub, and you uh, take fingerprints of somebody, they will not match with, the any, uh, with any record. So you have to have a record to identify that person. Uh, that is the problem uh, uh, with the artificial intelligence as to how uh, vast and comprehensive your data set is. And the biggest problem will come in terms of the uh, nuclear war. Because for other wars you have a lot of statistics and data which can be fed into the system. And with which the artificial intelligence can compare and draw inferences and conclusions. But they, since there has been no nuclear war, so there is no data set available. So what do you feed if you use it artificial intelligence in the nuclear command and control structure? So it is liable to go wrong. You cannot trust it fully. And then if you leave everything to artificial intelligence, uh, one, as I said, uh, the uh, problem with its accuracy, it may not always give you the right kind of results because it can mix up uh, the available data set which it has and depends on how comprehensive the data set is. The second thing is that uh, uh, associated with artificial intelligence is something called machine learning. Now machine learning is something that you have uh, programmed a machine, it is working on the basis of artificial intelligence and it is supposed to perform a certain task. While performing that task, it develops its own learning process and a stage comes once without any instruction from you, the machines starting by themselves what to do based on their own experience. 
So that machine learning combined with artificial intelligence uh, can lead to uh, dangerous outcomes. So these are the kind of problems uh, which will be faced in these technologies. That is why they can be disruptive. And that is why it is important to have some kind of uh, intervention by the humans at some stage. Yes, anyone else? Sir, uh, I have a question. Uh, my name is Sadiq Rahman and uh, I'm, I'm a scholar from Mary University. Uh, first of all, sir, thank you so much for such you know, submarines and their evolutionary process. Uh, basically, uh, the thing is that detection of submarine is very difficult. So, my question is that how to communicate with, own, with your own submarine in a time of crisis like we know regarding the second strike capability. So, everything in warfare is regarding speed and your communication information. So <clears throat> if you couldn't contact with your own submarine at time, in time, so how you can cater with you, the crisis and the, you can apply the second strike capability? Okay. You see, uh, that is where the problem comes. Once you go to the maritime domain, it will be discussed later on South Asian situation, but just uh, a quick reference to that. Uh, we say that we have a recessed deterrence posture. We keep our warheads and uh, the delivery system separate so that there is no accidental or unauthorized launch. But in case of submarine, there is no geographical uh, distance between the uh, delivery system, that is missile, whether it's a cruise missile or a ballistic missile, and the warhead. They are together. And then we also say that we have a centralized control. Even in case of the uh, battlefield nuclear weapons, short range weapons, these, they'll be centralized control by the NCA. But once you go to the submarines, uh, the problem comes that because of the difficulties of communication, you have, there is a degree of uh, delegation of authority. So the submarines have their targets and their orders written down and they're in the submarine in the safe deposit box which has got two keys. One is held by the captain of the submarine, the other is by the executive officer, who is the number two. And in case they, uh, uh, they, there is a breakdown of communication, they have their orders, and if both of them agree, then they can uh, uh, open that safe, take out those orders and instructions, and act accordingly. To communicate uh, uh, with the submarine, you, the only uh, communication which is again not very reliable is the uh, low frequency or very low frequency, what, what we call the LF and VLF uh, communication. Uh, what we have is the ultra high frequency and very high frequency uh, 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 which we use on our mobiles and others. But to, for or the only way which can have a degree of movement under the water are the low frequency and very low frequency. And for that you need to have very tall antennas on the shores, which are sometimes as tall as one kilometer. Only those can generate those very low frequency signals, which can be picked up by the submarine. And if submarine has to communicate, it has to come up to the peri periscope. You know that uh, tube which, which is raised by the submarine uh, outside, uh, which has got kind of a telescope through which they can see the area around. Uh, it goes above the surface of water and then you can look around. That tele periscope. So you have to come up to periscope and that means very close to the surface. And the periscope can be detected and the submarine, once it is close to the surface, is easier to detect. So for that period, the submarine becomes vulnerable. It can be detected by the enemy air or the anti-submarine ship or the enemy submarines. So that is a dangerous thing to do, but then uh, in emergency situation, they have to come up to that level to communicate. Then they raise their antennas outside water and then uh, they can communicate. In the British system, for instance, 
what they used to do was that in case of an emergency, once the submarine has gone on station, there will be signals transmitted from the shore, from the base. And as long as the uh, signals are being transmitted and the submarine can receive those, they will think that everything is okay. But if they stop receiving the signal, that means your shore base or your country has been devastated by a nuclear attack by the enemy. So you should now proceed with the second strike. And so you can imagine how perilous this situation is. That because of any technical fault, this transmission would stop. And if you could do that, then uh, uh, it would be a problem. Uh, I would suggest uh, if uh, any one of you has not seen it, I'm sure most of you must not have seen. There's a movie called Crimson Tide. Crimson Tide is the movie uh, in which uh, it's a Denzel, Denzel Washington is the hero in this. That is about the story of a submarine, nuclear submarine, which has gone under underwater and is a situation where a Russian general has gone rogue and is uh, about to launch a nuclear attack and this submarine receives an order uh, to launch uh, a counter attack at the Russian installations and while that order is being transmitted uh, somehow the communication gets disrupted and once the communication gets disrupted the captain insists that since we have got that order we must now uh, open up the instructions, see the target uh, details and act on that. The executive officer disagrees with him because they both have to agree to act. He disagrees. He says that in between the communication has dis been disrupted. Maybe in that intervening period the counter orders might have come which we might not have received. So we should not take action, we should wait for the communication to be restored and that leads to friction and in fact fighting amongst the crew the people start taking sides uh, some people siding with the captain some with the exo and ultimately the communication before they could take any action the communication is restored and the first message they receive is that those orders stand cancelled so that is the kind of uh, dangerous situation it can be. That is why uh, we say that once Indians have introduced this maritime leg of the triad, uh, it leads to certain dangerous situations because one, that degree of pre-delegation is there. So there is nothing stopping the captain and the XO if they agree, both of them, they can launch a weapon anytime, even without waiting for the instructions. So all this talk of political control and Prime Minister uh, pressing the button and everything, it is all hoax in case of a submarine because you do not have any political uh, person sitting there in the submarine or supervising you. So it's up to you, you have the weapon, you have the warhead, you have the orders, you have the data, you can do that. And there is no code required, no, no PAL system, nothing there. So that is why there is a danger also and the communication obviously is difficult. So that problem is, is, will always be there and it has to be guarded again. So people have devised uh, SOPs and things to make sure uh, that uh, without proper confirmation the submarine does not take an action. So that is why this two-man rule is very important in this case. Yes. So once we were talking about emerging technologies, one I said that certain technologies are in the experimental stage, developed at a large scale to be inducted in the military, uh, it will take about 10 to 20 years. 
and for, con for countries like South Asian countries like India, Pakistan, uh, we are far behind uh, those countries. So those technologies will be dependent on the assistance of those advanced countries to share that technology with us, which they will not be uh, ready to do at the early stages. They will like to have their monopoly. So it will be some time before they may be able to share with us. And in that case, uh, you can think of some time in the future, maybe 20 years from now, 25 years of, from now, where these technologies will start making an impact in South Asia. And that too, once you acquire these technologies from abroad, then you cannot induct these technologies at large scale because these are very costly. And one factor associated with the merging technologies is the cost prohibitiveness. So if they are cost prohibitive uh, and they are not easily affordable, every country may wish to have it but cannot have it. So for countries like particularly Pakistan with uh, the uh, very limited and uh, economic potential and resources to spend on these things, uh, it will be a long time before we can do that. But maybe uh, there are certain areas which will, which are already there in fact, uh, the cyber for instance, now that is something as the people uh, used to say at some time uh, uh, in the past about chemical and biological weapons at the, at poor man's atom bomb. So cyber is something like uh, poor man's emerging technology. It does not need much. It requires uh, a, a computer with a good processing speed, a good uh, Wi-Fi network, and three or four individuals uh, who are well trained uh, in uh, computer software, uh, uh, hackers probably, and they can, and there is no limit to, uh, uh, there is no range that 10,000 kilometers or 5,000 kilometers or 2,000 kilometers. This, this cyber attack can happen from one uh, end of the globe to the other. And by some individuals sitting somewhere in an apartment, they can launch an attack. They can hack into your system, launch a cyber attack and cause damage destruction. The problem then comes of attributability. How do you identify who was behind the attack? Now you may be able to uh, pinpoint the location from where the attack was launched, but who did it to identify that individual and who to retribute? Aap kiske khilaaf action karenge? retaliatory action. Ab, let's say a, a, a group of Indians are in Poland, in the Czech Republic, in the Czech Republic, in the cyber attack in Pakistan. So, will Poland pe attack in Poland? Or in the Czech Republic? Or in India? Pe attack so, it, it's very difficult, very tricky. But, it, that is a potential thing and which is within reach of not only states, poor or rich, but also individual groups. So those are the kind of technology, but more fanciful technologies, some of them may be abandoned along the way because of the cost effect, and some may uh, reach maturity in next 10, 15 years maybe, and their effects will start reaching South Asia maybe in another uh, two decades or so. century but very clearly 1945 the advent of the nuclear weapons uh, which we are going to discuss now uh, and uh, the other two aspects communication two way communication was also studied by them and yeah two way communication uh, already st started in fact uh, the biggest advantage the germans had in, during the second world war was that all german tanks were equipped with uh, whereas uh, most of the other countries like France, Britain, etc., they had wireless sets communication in the tanks, but they could just receive. They were not two-way uh, communication. So that two-way communication was an advantage. Similarly, aircraft initially 
did not have that and once they started having two way communication <coughs> then it was very easy to coordinate the uh, flight of different uh, uh, aircraft as well as uh, uh, getting instructions from the ground controllers uh, with the help of radars and others and long range also because it provided absolutely aircraft. Havoc they can cause. So I don't think so. Anybody in, in the right mind uh, would uh, take a decision to uh, totally uh, isolate the human from uh, these uh, machines. The humans would like to keep some kind of control somewhere. So that is for sure. Uh, about your second question about non-state actors. Now, uh, in case of emerging technology, as I said, the cost is prohibitive. And these are very sophisticated technologies available to very few countries at the moment. And they are kept uh, uh, very secretive. Uh, the only as aspect of the emerging technologies or the technologies which are now uh, more and more in use, uh, where the non-state actors can uh, uh, make use of it or exploit it is the cyber technology. So that is where they can uh, 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 do, and they have been doing uh, the, those kind of actions. Non-state actors have been doing individuals where without the uh, knowledge of the state or without the government of the state, because not much resources are required, and you have people around. Uh, we have seen in Al-Qaeda also, there were computer experts, others. So those are available. As far as uh, other weapons of mass destruction are concerned, uh, for instance, there was this all this talk after 9-11 of uh, the uh, nuclear terrorism and non-state actors getting access to nuclear weapons. Now that has been, uh, I, I, I never believed in that. Why? Because there were two, three factors. First of all, before 9-11, people were not conscious of nuclear security. To the extent they are, they were after 9/11. Previously, once uh, the uh, nuclear reactors were built, the dome which covers the uh, nuclear reactor, the concrete dome, it was designed to to be to take a hit uh, by a fighter aircraft, which are much smaller in size as compared to the uh, airliners, passenger airliners. So they were designed to, that even if they are hit by F-15, F-16 type of aircraft, uh, they could withstand that. But after 9-11, there was a realization that it cannot always be a fighter aircraft. It could be a, a Boeing 777 or uh, Airbus A380. Those huge aircraft full of thousands of liters of fuel. If they hit such a, a, a reactor dome, uh, how much chance it has got to withstand that. So then this uh, uh, started something which they called the design basis threat. So before building the reactor, they analyzed the threats which, are, uh, uh, which can possibly be there and then build it accordingly. Now these are being built even to take a hit by a large airliner. Secondly, uh, most of the, uh, the reactors, wherever they are located, there are no fly zones around them, and there are anti-aircraft guns, so that if an aircraft is trying to intrude, it can be shot down. So these precautions have been taken, so the probability of this kind of a sabotage uh, has reduced in my opinion. <coughs> Secondly, if you think that somebody will uh, make an atomic, they may wish to do that. Uh, as uh, reported to Osama bin Laden and his associates did, and 
they were actually uh, uh, also uh, pleased by people in Central Asian countries. They told them that we are bringing a cask which is carrying nuclear material, but it turned out to be some fake material. And even if you have material, there are it's a very intricate technology. To fabricate a nuclear device is a very difficult process in itself. So even if you have scientists uh, we join hands with you. Uh, you may have the design know-how. Uh, you may be able to fabricate an improvised device. But then the problem comes of the delivery. So I remember I was uh, uh, at a uh, gathering at the uh, Washington Press Club in 2010. And one old man got up and said, I am very worried about the safety and security of Pakistan nuclear weapons. Somebody may uh, steal a weapon from there and it can be very dangerous for the world. I said, take it easy, you can, don't lose your sleep on this because if somebody steals a weapon uh, in Pakistan, the first country affected will be Pakistan because it can only be detonated there. They won't then get an ICBM to launch that on America. So you don't worry, you will be safe. So the point is that you may have a weapon or weapon material and fabricate an in, a, 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 a improvised device, but how you deliver it? And the people have all kinds of funny ideas that you can put in a boat and then take it through the seas uh, to New York. How uh, uh, much uh, chances of survival that kind of a boat has in open seas and will it not be observed by any ship? passing by or some satellite or somebody uh, before it reaches New York, uh, probably traveling for four or five weeks or maybe more. So that those are the kind of fanciful ideas uh, uh, which are exaggerated out of proportion. Similarly, the that uh, uh, idea about the dirty bomb. A dirty bomb, what is a dirty bomb? It is nothing but a normal explosive wrapped around a radioactive material. Now you don't need the uranium or plutonium for that, which are the bomb materials. These radioactive materials are readily available in all hospitals, uh, lab where you have MRI and CT scan and all those kind of things. And then in the industrial uses also. But what happens with that is that once you blow that up, the casualties and damage is dependent on the size of conventional explosive which you have. The radioactive material inside does not kill any people, does not do any damage. There is no explosion because of that. Only thing is that once that device explodes, that radioactive material will be spread over a large area, will be carried by wind and it's not visible. It can even settle down on top of cars and on your clothing and everywhere on top of buildings. Only person which can be killed will be person who has been exposed to it for hours on end. But otherwise some people might get sick and they can be treated in hospital. The only effect would be economic disruption because then you will have to decontaminate that whole area. And that economic activity will come to stand still in that uh, radius where it has spread. That is it. And, and uh, so much is made up out of it. Now you cannot have security guards or rangers or uh, army people guarding every uh, 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 medical lab and hospital. It is not possible. Uh, but people exaggerate the effect and it, it is counterproductive because the more you exaggerate the threat, the more fear it creates, which results in panic in case of such an incident. And that uh, is, is more dangerous than the actual damage it can do. So I think uh, we can then proceed on the next part. Yeah. One last very quick question. Yeah, I think, sir, we can have in the next because already is uh, yeah. only 30 minutes are left. These are the limitations. In Korean War, MacArthur and other commanders uh, 
asked President Eisenhower uh, to allow the use of nuclear weapons, but they were not allowed, despite the fact that they had to suffer a lot of reverses there. Next. Now, crisis has replaced wars. As we have seen in India-Pakistan case, that in the first 25 years of our independence, we had a war in 47, 48 on Kashmir, we had a war in 65. In fact, before the main 65 war, we had that run of Kutch conflict, then 65 war, 71 war, but after that there has been no major war, except that uh, limited military conflict in Kargil, otherwise there have been crises, brass crisis, 1990 crisis, 2001-2 crisis, 2008 crisis, uh, this Pulwama Balakot crisis. So crisis replace actual war. So then you have to focus more on uh, finding ways and means for crisis management. Next. And because of the nuclear weapons, deterrence became cornerstone of strategy. Next. Nowhere in history you will find that there was no clash, no direct war between major powers. Go back 14, 15, 100 years, you find the war between Persians and Romans. And then later on also all major powers have been fighting. We've talked about Germany and France and Germany and Austria and Germany and Russia. They all be always been fighting with each other. But after the advent of nuclear weapons, the two superpowers, the Soviet Union and the United States, they never went to direct war with each other. There were wars in the peripheral areas or proxy wars, but they never came into confrontation, direct confrontation with each other. Because they knew that the consequences could be very serious. Next. Now these nuclear weapons are actually not we weapons to be used in war. They are political weapons and psychological weapons and they have to be used in that way. Because once it comes to the use of nuclear weapons, then it is the end game. After that, there is nothing will be left. Next. Now coming to deterrence. I hope this definition is clear. Now, but deterrence in a sense means that you have to prevent somebody from taking an action which is undesirable from your point of view. That is an attack on your territory or an attack on one of your allies. And how do you deter or prevent that action is by imposing the threat of costs which are unbearable. So it also requires rational actors who can do the, this calculation of cost and gain. Because if you do any work, then you say that I am doing this, I am doing this, I am doing this, I am doing this, so what will be the benefit of Cost gain analysis you do always. So any rational actor, once he does the cost gain analysis, says that if I carry out this attack and it leads to escalation to nuclear exchange and nuclear weapons are fired because that threat is there, the end result will be disastrous, so I am not going to gain anything. So my losses will be more than the gains and that will prevent and deter that person from taking that action. So that is the sense of deterrence. Now, deterrence is something uh, which is not only uh, related to nuclear weapons. It has always been there. It's part of all religions. This uh, concept of going to hell, if you don't uh, 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 do well in this world, is deterrence to deter people from committing sins. Similarly, in all societies, 
all these laws we have are to deter people from violating uh, the societal norms. Uh, these traffic signals, you, you will get fines if you break the signal, although in Pakistan these days it is out of fashion. Uh, but the laws are there. Similarly, uh, the death sentence or life imprisonment for committing murder. So, if uh, somebody commits murder, from thinking about it, it would be in the first place, a rational person would be deterred from doing that. But does it, does it stop people from committing murder? It does happen. So what does it mean? It means that there are certain irrational people also in societies. And they are oblivious of the cost gain analysis and they will take an action without thinking of the consequences. Or they may think that they can get away with this without being caught. So these are the two things which can uh, make people take a chance. Conventional deterrence has never worked. Even smaller powers have been audacious enough to attack stronger military powers, thinking that even if we lose, the cost will be bearable. But this kind of mistake is not available in a nuclear conflict because then the cost of failure is unbearable. So that is what deters. Next. Now there are different types of deterrence. Deterrence by punishment, this is the simplest thing that if you do something, I will hit you back with nuclear weapons. So this is deterrence by punishment. The cost will by imposing a high cost of that action. So that is deterrence by punishment. Deterrence by denial is that irrespective of the fact, fact that nuclear weapons are there, if somebody still ventures, so one is that you stay <coughs> away go for nuclear attack, other is you fight it out. If there is a conventional attack, you meet it at the conventional level, if things are still not controlled, then you can escalate to nuclear level. But you fight it out and deny the enemy uh, or your opponent whatever they want to achieve. The example of the first is the strategy of massive retaliation. The example of the second is the uh, flexible response strategy in which initially you fought at conventional level, then battlefield nuclear weapons, then theater nuclear weapons, and then to strategic nuclear weapons. Then you must have heard this extended deterrence. Now extended deterrence is that basically your deterrence is to prevent an attack on your territory. But in an alliance situation where there is one power with large nuclear force, it assures its allies that if there is a nuclear threat or nuclear attack on your territory, I will use my nuclear weapons to protect you. That is extending deterrence. That means you are extending the reach of your deterrence beyond your geographical borders. Now this could just be done by the, your ability to reach that area with long-range weapons or physically deploying some weapons on that territory. As the Americans had done uh, by deploying weapons in Europe, which are still there in Germany, in uh, Belgium, in Holland, in Italy. And some time ago, they were they had wep weapons in South Korea also. Uh, they have some weapons in Okinawa, but they have provided extended times NATO ties as well as bilateral assurances to South Korea and Japan. So this is extended deterrence. The problem with the extended deterrence is that its credibility is always doubtful. Uh, once the Americans extended their deterrence to the European allies, the questions were asked in uh, European countries that would Americans be ready to sacrifice New York and Washington for the sake of London and Paris? And the answer was always no. And that is why the British and the French, they developed their own independent deterrence capability. There was other reasons also, political reasons, because they had been major powers 
and they thought that if they do not develop this capability of their own, they will be out of the decision making loop and uh, their status as major powers will be dented. Then is intra war deterrence. Now, basically, once you have deterrence capability, you hope that it will prevent all kinds of war, all kinds of aggression, as our strategy is, Pakistani strategy, that we want to deter conventional as well as nuclear threat from India. But sometimes uh, the convention war starts for some reason or the other. Should you then just give up deterrence and then start preparing the nuclear weapons to use or you, to, you should still make an effort to restore the deterrence. And that is what is called the intra-war deterrence. That during a war, you want to restore the deterrence. How do you do that is through signaling. Nuclear signaling by, let's say, raising the readiness level of your nuclear weapons by moving them forward to the launch areas, short of uh, firing them. So these signals are picked up by the other side and it might bring some sense into them and the conflict may stop. Then minimum deterrence, this is a term which is commonly used but uh, very rarely understood. In very simple terms, minimum deterrence is that you should have a small nuclear arsenal which should be survivable, uh, survivable enough that in case there is a preemptive first strike by the enemy, you should still be left with enough weapons to hit back and cause unacceptable damage. So, not beyond that. It has no relationship with the number of weapons the other side has. And why this kind of posture is adopted is that you want to avoid getting involved into a nuclear arms race. To just determine for yourself, okay, to cause unacceptable damage or to hurt grievously the other side, I must be able to hit these 5 or 10 targets on the enemy territory. And if they carry out a surprise first attack and destroy some of our weapons, we should still be left with enough to hit those targets. And that will provide a show deterrence. And then you don't build up more than that. You just focus on the survivability of whatever you have. So that is uh, to prevent uh, the arms race. Now in case of India and Pakistan after 98 as both sides <coughs> said they are going to have minimum deterrence, that was just to allay the fears of the outside power that there is not going to be an unbridled arms race in South Asia. But then they added a prefix, credible. Credible minimum deterrence. That means neither side was satisfied with having a minimal size of force. They wanted something more than minimum. That is why they added credible. So now if you see this, the, the estimated size of, nobody knows exact numbers, but the estimates you get in Bulletin of Atomic Scientists or Federation of American Scientists or SIPRI or everywhere. So you find that Roughly around 150 weapons uh, each in India and Pakistan, which is not a minimum or minimal size of castle, there is something more than minimum. So that is what credible minimum deterrence means. And then uh, this term which was also introduced by Pakistan, full spectrum deterrence. That was brought in because India was insisting since the nuclearization of <coughs> 1998 that there is a space for limited conventional conflict below the nuclear threshold. They tried it in 2001 too, that limited war and Islamic slicing and all those, they could not do that. Then they went on to this cold start doctrine. And to deter that kind of thinking, then Pakistan introduced battlefield nuclear weapons. Giving the message that we have all kinds of weapons and capability to deter conflict at any level, whether it is subconventional, conventional, limited conventional, all-out conventional, or nuclear conflict. So that is what is meant by the 
full spectrum retailers that we are able to cover the full spectrum of threats and then uh, this term cross domain deterrence this is fashionable these days basically there is nothing new in it what you are doing you are trying to deter conventional attack with your nuclear weapons so that means you were deterring uh, aggression in another domain in conventional domain with your nuclear weapons similarly now people say that if there is a major cyber attack we will we might think of using nuclear weapons so that is another domain so if you are using your nuclear weapons to, to deter in different domains attacks in different domain with different means not with nuclear weapons in cyber in conventional in nuclear that is cross domain deterrence and that is what is now uh, been named in the recent american document on their national security strategy and their a uh, nuclear posture review and they have used this term integrated deterrence and it all uh, is again uh, integrating all uh, types of domains conventional cyber space nuclear and deter them that is called the integrated deterrence <coughs> next Now deterrence has certain basic requirements, and first of all, these is communication. It does not mean a telephone or something. Communication means <coughs> messaging. Communication of deterrence threat. Unless you are able to clearly communicate the deterrence threat, it will not be effective. so it has to be clearly communicated and what are the means for that first of all is through public statements and what are public statements a uh, top leader civilian or military uh, holding a press conference making a statement or a televised speech or speaking at some conference or uh, seminar or giving an interview to some a uh, tv channel so those are different means of uh, sending a, a public message the second uh, means of communication is uh, the demonstrative actions so your deterrence threat will never be credible unless you have demonstrated your technical capability and demonstrative actions include your nuclear tests your missile tests and also once you display your uh, missile system then other capabilities on 23rd march parade and others so these are demonstrative actions the third one is through the diplomatic means and diplomatic means are uh, they work two ways first of all is that you have your uh, uh, representative in the other capital you can send a message a telegram secret telegram to him and he can then go to his counterparts in their ministry of external affairs pass on that message or other way round is that you could call the ambassador of the other country to your foreign office and give him the message so that he can deliver it to him government then is the third party sometimes the threat communication break down as it happened in case of 2001 2002 crisis and we saw a lot of visitors coming uh, the americans high profile americans british uh, coming uh, to islamabad and then going to delhi or coming to delhi and coming to islamabad carrying message from one side to the other so that is another means of uh, communication but there is a, you have to be careful about it there is it is a dangerous thing to also because you cannot trust the third party because they will have their own interests so you don't know whether they are conveying your message honestly and uh, clearly or they are mixing up something from their own side so th that the danger has to be uh, kept in mind using third party
and finally is the hotlines. So you have BGMS hotlines, and in 2005 we also established border safety hotlines, which were meant specifically to exchange information in case of any nuclear incident. So these are the means of communication. Then is capability. This is very obvious. This is something which is concrete. You have demonstrated your nuclear capability. You have missile system which are tested. You have other delivery system. So that is your capability. And without capability, your deterrence threat will be a bluff. So you have to have a demonstrated capability. And third is the credibility. Now credibility has two elements. One is the second strike capability. If you have such a small force and it is also vulnerable, which can be destroyed with a preemptive uh, first strike, then your deterrence cannot be credible. You have to have a second strike capability. And the second element of credibility is the political will. If you have the capability, but you do not have the political will, people know that their leadership is weak. They will back off at the last moment. They will not take that tough decision. <coughs> then your credibility is undermined. Now that is intangible, immeasurable. Uh, it cannot be counted. It can just be estimated because of the historical record of conduct of a particular country or a leader. That if so and so is leader, he will do whatever he is saying. If so and so is leader, he is likely to back off, or he is likely to come under pressure from outside powers and uh, not take such a decision. So that credibility, <laughs> this political will is very important, which you have to display. Next. Now very quickly, uh, we'll go over how the nuclear strategy developed. Interestingly, you have a doctrine, and that doctrine dictates the type of forces, size of forces, nature of forces you have. If you have a defensive doctrine, you will focus more on anti-tank weapons, surface-to-air missiles, infantry forces. But if you have an offensive uh, uh, strategy, you would like to have more tanks, more aircraft, uh, more long-range guns, uh, more mechanized forces. But nuclear weapons are interesting because these weapons were used in 1945 without having a doctrine. And that even after the end of the war, people uh, were reluctant to talk about nuclear weapons because they had that guilty feeling that we have caused so much of destruction uh, with these weapons, so let's not talk about them. Even the scientists who had created these weapons, people like uh, Robert Oppenheimer, uh, they also had created this monster and how to put this jelly back into the bottle. However, uh, uh, there are certain events internationally which forced the Americans to rethink. Uh, first of all was the 1948 Berlin blockade uh, by the Russians. Then uh, the establishment of NATO in 1949. And it was expected that the Soviets are going to catch up. They are going to develop their nuclear capability. But nobody expected them to do it so soon. And in, then in August 1949, the Russians tested their first nuclear weapon. And that came as a shock to the Americans. The 49 was very important because NATO was established. The Russians tested their first nuclear weapon. And in October 49, the Chinese Communist Revolution succeeded. So the West thought that now these are two major countries adjacent to each other under the communist rule. And this will spread communism. There will be that domino effect. And one after the other, the countries fall under communist rule. Then in 1950, uh, the Korean War started. And that further uh, cemented those fears that now they are going to test our patients. And they knew that the Soviets had a large conventional advantage in Europe. If they attack Europe conventionally, we cannot stop them. Now, despite the fact that the Soviets had tested their nuclear weapon, the Americans still had this superiority in numbers and capability because they could hit Russian mainland because of their bases in Europe. Whereas Russians could not 
reach America at that time. So they could make use of their nuclear superiority and that is why they started thinking of nuclear doctrine and the first doctrine which was announced in 1954 by uh, Mr. Uh, John Foster Dulles, the Secretary of State of US was strategy of massive retaliation. This was a simple strategy that in case there is a Soviet attack on Europe, our convention forces will not fight it out, they will just let us know. So they will act, be acting as a tripwire, give warn us of the attack, and then we will hit Soviet Union population centers and the industry with large scale nuclear attack and destroy everything. But then they found out that uh, this is a very inflexible doctrine because the problem is that against a major attack, it could be valid. But if there is a small scale attack and that too in peri peripheral areas like Korean War and India, would you use massive retaliation against Russia? So then people started having doubts about it. And there was a lot of debate within America. As a result, uh, once the uh, Kennedy administration came in the White House in early 1961. They started the review of the strategy under McNamara, who was the Secretary of Defense, and they came up with a strategy known as the strategy of flexible response. This meant that the threat will be met at the same level. Conventional attack will initially be met with conventional forces until you can hold it off, but if you feel that you cannot hold it off anymore, then you add short range battlefield weapons which will be used to escalate to one level. If the Russians stop good enough and then they come to table, if they don't, then we will raise one step up to theater nuclear weapons. Now theater nuclear weapons were the ones which were deployed in Europe, but they could reach Russian mainland and all Eastern Europe. And then uh, if still it does not stop, then finally there will be strategic nuclear exchange between Soviet Union and America hitting each other's countries. The problem with this was that, first of all, you had to raise the level of your conventional forces because you had to fight conventionally, not just give warning. So that, that was the first thing you had to invest in building your conventional forces. Second problem was that it could only work if the Soviets agreed to play your rules of the game. You are saying that, okay, we will raise one notch from conventional to battlefield weapons and then from there to theater nuclear weapons. But once you have used battlefield nuclear weapons, they are not obliged to play the same game. They might straight away go to theater weapons or to strategic weapons because you have crossed the nuclear threshold. So then there were doubts about it. And then Americans got involved in Vietnam, so they could not focus on building their conventional strength in Europe. So there were criticism on this and McNamara himself started having doubts about it. So in 65, he then uh, moved on to what was called as the strategy of a show destruction. Uh, that was meant to uh, prevent the uncontrolled uh, buildup of nuclear weapons because flexible response wanted different categories of weapons in large numbers, small weapons, theater weapons, strategic weapons, and in large numbers because the number of targets was large. Strategy of short destruction laid down certain parameters that we should be able to destroy uh, one third of the Soviet war making industry, half of its population, and for this so many weapons would be required, so then they uh, said we can put a ceiling on the number of weapons. But by that time, by the mid-60s, the Soviets had also developed the capability to retaliate and hit back at America because of the Sputnik test which they carried out in 57 and the missiles that were developed. So then people said it is not a short destruction on our part, it is mutual assured destruction because in case this kind of war happens, both sides are assured to be destroyed. Once uh, this strategy was adopted, the NATO adopted the strategy of flexible response in 1967 and is still sticking to it. Why? Because they, they 
think that if the, those battle field weapons are removed from European soil, if there is a conflict in Europe, the Americans will not have no incentive to uh, go for strategic nuclear seal and get their own country destroyed. So they will say, okay, let the Europeans deal with it. But if, as long as their weapons are there in Europe, they will really nearly get involved in this. Then uh, in the next election campaign, presidential campaign, Nixon criticized this doctrine and said this gives only two choices to the American president, suicide or surrender. Suicide in the sense that if you authorize such a strike, you are sure that the enemy can hit back and kill hundreds of millions of uh, Americans. So that is a suicide. And if you do not, that means you are surrendering to the other side. So he said there should be more flexibility. So once he came into power, uh, he started a new review uh, under his Secretary of Defense, G.M. Schlesinger, and came up with the doctrine of limited nuclear options in which what they did was that all those hundreds of targets or thousands of targets which were on the target list, they were grouped into small packages of 10 targets, 20 targets interlinked with each other. And they said instead of going for a full-blown strike, we'll fire, fire, fire one package of 10 targets, let's say, and then wait for the response. If the Russians spawn in kind, then we'll go for another package and another package till the things come to uh, a standstill. So that the damage can be limited. And then focus was also on damage limitation and city avoidance. Because cities are considered to be hostage in this game. Once you've destroyed the cities, then uh, you have done the damage, so the other side will have also no inhibition to hit your cities. As long as you keep their cities safe, they will think that we should also not attack the cities so that they don't retaliate against our cities. So they are kept as hostages or withhold. Then uh, uh, came uh, uh, Jimmy Carter in the uh, mid 70s and uh, he initially went along with the uh, Nixon strategy, but then he came up with a countervailing strategy, which meant that this is again, this was a war fighting or strategy of deterrence by denial. That if the Soviets attack, we'll mash them up at every level. So they keep raising the escalation level and we will keep matching them and deny them victory at every cost. But then in the next election campaign, uh, Ronald Reagan was critical of this. He said this is a passive and defensive strategy. Why should we be aiming at denying victory to the Soviets? We should be aiming at ensuring American victory. So he came up with a strategy which came to be known as the prevailing strategy, that America should prevail in every situation. And then in 83, he announced his SDI strategic defense initiative Star Wars program, it's, that's a whole detailed discussion. I don't want to go into details of that. And then the Soviet Union started breaking down and the end of the Cold War. After the end of the Cold War, the Americans then started what they call the nuclear posture review, which happens every eight years or so. So first of those came in uh, 1994, the other one came in 1994 was not made public, it remained uh, secret. 2002, uh, part of it was made public and part of it was confidential. This was, 2002 came immediately after 9-11. The Americans were in a very furious mood at that time and that was a departure from the earlier strategy in which they even uh, raised the possibility of hitting uh, with nuclear weapons against non-nuclear states. And they named that so-called axis of evil, including Libya, Iraq, Iran, North Korea. <coughs> in 2010, the nuclear posture review during Obama's time, it came after his Prague speech and the tone had changed. Although essentially the elements remained the same, but the tone was uh, mellowed down and uh, uh, they, they said that we want to reduce the salience of nuclear weapons in our strategy. And then 2018 NPR uh, during uh, Trump's time, uh, which was more or less the same, but with a um, 
stronger language, and we have seen the recent Biden uh, uh, is uh, the NPR, uh, in which they have talked of integrated deterrence, and they have specifically identified Russia as the immediate threat and China as the future threat. So that is all about uh, nuclear strategy and deterrence. Don't want to go uh, uh, any further. We want it overstepping. So we can have a very quick 10 minutes uh, question answer session. Also, we can have uh, the question answer session at the end. It is a complete uh, uh, one hour. Okay. So we you can note down your questions. And at the end, we have the session. We can discuss those. I don't want to yes, delay. We have a lunch break now. We so don't want to keep you away from lunch. I am sure you need it uh, badly now. have a few quick uh, announcements. Uh, you would find a journal and a monograph in front of you on the tables. Uh, they belong to you. You have you, you can take them home and just read. And secondly, uh, I, I just saw that some of the participants were taking the pictures of the slides. I wanted to recommend uh, a Stinson Center's uh, certificate course. Uh, it's about uh, deterrence, restoring deterrence with its title. It's a certificate course and uh, it is provided with a lot of examples and everything. So, yeah, now you can enjoy your lunch. Thank you. Nuclear strategy and the nuclear weapons, military strategy, was all about the, the general uh, perspective, the international perspective. So I'm trying to link that with the regional perspective. Okay. Uh, you all are from the South Asian region. Who told you this thing? Everybody has seen the map? Yes. yes. Who has made the map? <coughs> the Britishers. The Britishers made the map. Why north is up and south is down? Why not south is up and north is down? Why the, why the map is such that the Pacific is somewhere else and Atlantic is here and the Indian is here. The world is not the way it is. It is the way it is presented. So you take the world as it is presented to you. Nothing is neutral. Everything is with an agenda, with an idea. So you are also an idea. You should have an idea if you are not an idea. So if you do not have an idea, so we will give you an idea. So from tomorrow onward, you will carry an idea. Okay? We are here to contest different ideas. So you should have your own idea. I will present my idea. If you accept my idea, you are not thinking. If you want to ask questions and contradict, you Islam is no is stronger than yes, because from saying no, you need to know what is exist, what exactly exists. There is no God. First, you demolish everything, and then you construct only a man. Okay. So what I'm going to say, you all fit it with my idea, and most of you already have the idea, because that idea has already been presented before you. Okay. Okay, next slide. So I start with the concept of war. Because I started with the war. In the first session, I asked you certain questions about war. So normally we said that it is continuation of politics to other means. Okay, politics may do Do you know what is power? What is power? Anybody? Not teachers, but students. <laughs> Get another person to do what? It would not have done otherwise. He could not have done otherwise, or he is not interested to do. Yes. Or he is not willing to do. Yes. To compel. To, to, your... compel, to force. To, to push. To be able to. Your... 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 Abhi aisa hai ki power is a way to convince you with your own consent to start doing what I want you to do. Yes. Huh? Yes. This is called something else. Ye kya hai? 
There's social engineering going on. You will do with your own will, free will. But what I desire that you can do. Okay? But uh, war and politics and power, there has always been shortage of power with the man. He was struggling with the power and always found short of it. Kabi usne kya kya patr ra hai. To patr ra hai khas. Ehliya se jada aage dhu. Nii nai chata tha. Phir usne wo neza, teer, kumaan, ye sab kuch weapon shepan banaya and always found himself with the shortage of power. Hamesha apne aap ko thoda sa or, thoda sa or exert karne ko shi. Thik hai? There came the chemistry I used to the help of manpower or kya hua explosives ke. For the first time, jab gunpowder there was a revolution. You could explore things. First, you were to destroy things by physical action. Gandhi built it, you to it. But TNT and chemistry was very limited. So here came the bigger bang. That was the nuclear bang. So nuclear weapon, what did War to change karna chota sa concept. Transform kar diya. Lekin usse baad, ye problem ya hai, we need to, we wanted to eliminate the war, but we found out that war cannot be eliminated. Cannot be eliminated. We can only manage and limit it. Okay? Eliminate nahi kya ra sa. Nature of war remains unchanged. Only the character and forms changes. Achha, ye nahi hua, that nuclear weapon came from the destructive level so that the war will end. The war will not end. The people have found another way to fight. Okay? Violence with the interplay of passion, reason, and chance. This is the fight. Okay, the fight is pre-ordained and pre-destined. This is the fact. Is it? Is it? This is the fact. I have talked about this. That war is pre-ordained and pre-destined. Then you are saying that it is نہیں ویسے پوچھو can be achieved without destruction and violence. Okay? Submission of your will. That you have to surrender your own thoughts. Knowingly or sometimes unknowingly. Why nations go to war, honor, fear, and trust? This is what you remember. Okay, nuclear revolution came out, it was highly destructive, but defense was absolutely not possible. The only defense against the nuclear weapon is the nuclear weapon itself. Indiscriminate instant mass killing was possible with one press of button. That was unprecedented. Great equalizer. Only you need to have one weapon. That's more than enough. If you can have one, it is enough. But you always, how much is enough? Is never going to be a ultimate answer. You'll always be struggling to have more and more. In the security, there is no end in the power, there is no end in the nuclear weapon. Military victory is not possible. Preservation of status quo. This is a dilemma. You have to... Do you agree with me that the status quo, you will always love that status quo must? Yes. For example, if you are a chodri and you are a zamidar and you are a land owner, you are a big... So you always say that this is not here and we are here and we are here and we are here. But if you are a person who is not a land owner, you will always love that this system will change. How many of you believe that the status quo in Pakistan should change? Change is always good. We always love change. That is why Imran Khan is a story that is changing. But there is an ugly change. You always need to understand what is the change. Change for the good or change for the bad. 
in the process of struggling for change, sometimes you lose whatever you are, otherwise enjoy it. So you always love to change the status quo if you are not the beneficiary. Who wants to preserve the status quo? The P5, the big P5. So are you the big P5? So why you are outcasted South Asian Pakistanis are not allowed? Why? Because you are challenging their potential. Unki ability to influence Pakistan. Why Pakistan is suffering? Because sometimes, somewhere, you do not agree with them on certain things. Not the government, but the people. Okay, then it has a problem that it, if the status quo with the nuclear weapon is preserved because you can't fight anymore. If you can't fight anymore, then how to change the status quo? So it freezes the political disputes. That is how the Kashmir issue is suffering because of the nuclearization of India and Pakistan because no more, now with the use of force you can change the, the borders. Okay? This is a big struggle. How to now proceed forward with the Kashmir issue? Kashmir issue ko nuclearization ke baad kaise dekhna hoga? Ye aapko sawal pushna padega. Purani instrument ke saath ab Kashmir ko hal nahi kaya ja sata. Isi liye we are not relying on the military force, we are relying on another argument that is called humanitarian argument. That the humanitarian and human rights values are under threat and they need freedom and they need the right of self-determination promised to, do, to, to them by the, the United Nations Charter. Next is, <coughs> strategy is the bridge between ends and means, art of distribution and application of military means to achieve the end of policies, Strategic is the highest level, population is the theater level, and the technical is the, is the smallest level. Where the things are done here, Modi Modi Bhatia, next. Okay. Nuclear strategy is a contradiction in its own self. There can be no nuclear strategy. And it's basically a useless term. Because it says use of non use. How can I teach you? of not slapping the slap. How can I teach you of not driving the car? You are already not doing it. Samadhariya Kumar, if you are not able to write, and I am going to teach how not to write, can I teach you how not to write? I can only teach you how to write, but if I am asked to teach you how not to write, nuclear weapons are the weapons which say that we will not use them. Now I am not going to teach you how to use non-use. Where is the, that, that story? ये जो जब नेटर स्ट्रेटजी बना रहे हैं जो डॉक्टर वाको तार थे उस वक्त उनकी जो माइंड पे अगर एक आप एक फार्मर के पास जाएं ना एक ड्राइवर के पास जाएं एक किसान के पास जाएं और एक सरकारी मुलाजम के पास जाएं और उसे एक ही सवाल पूछे तो हर एक अपने हिसाब से उसका डिफरेंट आंसर देगा बिकॉज़ उन दोनों को बिठाएं तो उनसे बात पूछे तो उनकी जिंदगी के प्रेफरेंसेस और उनके एक्सपीरियंसेस डिफरेंट हैं तो दे विल स्टार्ट आंसरिंग डिफरेंटली ठीक है सो दी न्यूक्लियर स्ट्रेटजी जब अमेरिका के हां वहां पे उस पे बेस्ट छिड़ी तो दे वर हैविंग द आइडियाज ऑफ द वर्ल्ड वॉर 1 बिकॉज़ वर्ल्ड वॉर 2 के अंदर तो भी उन्होंने लेसन तो लर्न किया ही नहीं था ये जो अभी हमने रिवॉल्यूशन कर हां इसे हमने यूएस के पर्सपेक्टिव से हमने हमें ऐसा लगा कि सोवियत यूनियन एक इवन फोर्स थी so इससे ही आपको ये पता लग जाना चाहिए कि 1945 के बाद जो वर्ल्ड ऑर्डर 
अनवेल हुआ है उसमें सिर्फ एक ही चीज हम चूंकि अलाय थे अमेरिका के साथ और हमारी आप यूनिवर्सिटियों में जाके आप लाइब्रेरियों को छान ले जाए थोड़ा सा आप वो किताबें ही मेरे भी वही जो अमरीका की और जो भी आप वो किताबें आएंगे तो डेट इज वाई आई सेट इन द बिगिनिंग डू यू लव कलोनियलिज्म यू मोस्ट ऑफ दस लव द ठीक है तो वी आर द विक्टिम ऑफ द नॉलेज बड़ी ऊंची आवाज में वी आर द विक्टिम ऑफ द नॉलेज व्हिच वी कंसीडर इज अ नॉलेज इज बेसिकली एंड एट अस दिस केयर फाइट मैन बर्डन white man burden to discipline everything and i am going to tell you what is right and what is wrong either with us or against us ha either with us or against us ha wo to theek hai wo to koi baat nahi hai to sab powerful log aise kehte hain are you with us or not against aap choudhri bhi ye kehta hai das bhai tu mere naal hai ke udhe naal hai bada baar nikal nahi matlab choudhri ki puchta hai ae puchta hai bhai wo mere naal hai ke do number nahi kar rahi sidhi kar do तो पाकिस्तान में हमें क्या वो अमेरिका ये कहता है ना हमें बताते कुछ है करते कुछ है बिकॉज वी प्रॉब्लम ये है कि वी कान कंट्रेक्ट दैम बट वी वांट टू सरवाइव हमारे यहाँ एक प्रॉब्लम है ऑफ आइडेंटिटी वी वांट टू लिव स्ट्रगल एंड अचीव समथिंग बट वी डोंट हैव द लेक्ट इंफ्रास्ट्रक्चर द टूल्स मुसलमानों का भी यही प्रॉब्लम है मुसलमानों की आइडियोलॉजी आइडेंटिटी बहुत डिफरेंट है लेकिन दे डोंट फाइंड दैम सेल्फ एनीथिंग टू डू समथिंग अच्छा ये जो था वर्ल्ड वॉर वन की ना आइडिया से इन्होंने सारी स्ट्रेटजी बनाई तो ये वन साइड स्टोरी है मोनोलॉग है अमेरिकन परस्पेक्टिव है एंड वट एवर आई आर यू रीड इज बेसिकली क्रिश्चियन यूरोपियन सेंट्रिक वर्ल्ड व्यू दैट्स ऑल फिनिश फुल स्टॉप वट एवर आई आर दैट वी टीच एंड वी रीड इज ऑल अबाउट द क्रिश्चियन परस्पेक्टिव एंड यूरोपियन परस्पेक्टिव ऑफ द वर्ल्ड दैट्स ऑल फुल स्टॉप अगर आपके पास अपना आइडिया ही नहीं है तो आइडिया को आपको आइडिया इज नॉट अबाउट रॉ थिंकिंग आइडिया इज वेरी सोफिस्टिकेटेड अरेंजमेंट ऑफ योर वर्ड्स थॉट्स in a manner that it is understandable and it is in the same context to duniya mein chal raha hai aap ontology ki baat karte hain tell me what is the ontology what is ontology nature anybody nature nature of being the study of things jisme hum kehte hain what exists what is real ontology kya kehti hai what is real to knowledge hasil karne ke liye sabse pehle ontological principles ko pata karna padega what exists and what does not exist जिस ऑन्टोलॉजी को आप पढ़ते हैं ना हम पढ़ते हैं उसमें द फ्यू थिंग्स विच डू नॉट एग्जिस्ट विच यू केटर फॉर आप यू थिंक दैट दे एग्जिस्ट एंड फॉर दैम दे डोंट एग्जिस्ट प्रॉब्लम यह है कि वो परस्पेक्टिव ही डिफरेंट है दैट परस्पेक्टिव हैज बीन इरेक्टेड बाय डिमोलिशिंग एन अदर परस्पेक्टिव दैट इज कॉल्ड थियोसेंट्रिज्म वो वहाँ से ट्रांसफर होके एंथ्रोपोसेंट्रिज्म की तरफ हम चले गए हैं आपको पता ही नहीं चला anthropocentrism says that the man is at the center of the universe aur hum kehte hain the center of the universe is allah hai to kitna bada farq ho gaya they say that man is at the center of the universe and you say nahi ji we are in the periphery and the god is allah is in the center bahut bada problem hai wo baat hai next nuclear deterrents mein assumption ye hai that the states are rational actors एंड स्टेट आर यूनिट रिएक्टर्स कि स्टेट में एक ही बंदा फैसला करता है ये नहीं होता कि मल्टीपल डायमेंशन में हर बंदा इस्लामाबाद और फैसला कर रहा है पिटी और फैसला कर रहा है अब पाला में कुछ और फैसला हो रहा है ऐसा नहीं होता फैसला एक करेगा कोई शख्स और वो रैशनल फैसला करेगा कॉस्ट बेनिफिट एनालिसिस के साथ फैसला करेगा अगर एक स्टेट है ही रैशनल नहीं है तो हम उसके ऊपर डेटरेंस अप्लाई नहीं कर सकते बिकॉज डेटरेंस इज अबाउट समथिंग अबाउट thinking of cost benefit acha ek aur bhi aapke liye ek nuclear weapon fire kar dunga yahan pe ki basically nuclear weapon is has some relationship with cost and what you can help me with the concept of cost power 
एक लव्स जेटर्स में आपको पढ़ाया ना नहीं अनएक्सेप्टेबल डैमेज only god can deliver an unacceptable damage in the previous frame and now here is a weapon where a man can also make an unacceptable damage okay so ye jo capitalist god hai na this weapon is a capitalist god okay it is a god of the capitalism because it take hostage the infrastructure ye kehta hai ki agar mujhe aapne meri baat na maani to main aapki itni tab abadi itni industry aur itna railway station aur ye communication center tabah kar dunga हमने पहले कहा पहले तो उसने वो ब्रिज तोड़ दिए अब आपको कहता है कि रैशनैलिटी और इमेजनैलिटी दोनों को मिक्स करना है यू बी यू बी अ रैशनल एक्टर एंड बिल्ट इन के रैशनैलिटी इनटू योर कम्युनिकेशन थोड़ा सा पागल बना है इसमें नहीं होगा तो आपको कोई सीरियस नहीं है ठीक है तो डेटर्स के अंदर ये जो नेक्स्ट ओके सो अभी आ जाते साउथ इंडिया में नेक्स्ट ये एक एक कर हिंदू इज अ ज्योग्राफिकल आइडेंटिटी हिंदू जो आपने सुना है ना ये कोई किसी मजहब का नाम नहीं है ये किसी कौन का नाम नहीं है ये उनको खुद भी नहीं पता कि उनका ये नाम है ठीक ठीक है? 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 इसीलिए वो अपने रिलीजन को हिंदुज नहीं कहते हैं ठीक है ये हिंदुत्व भी बेसिकली एक गलत नाम है अच्छा अब ये हिंदू जो है देर इज नथिंग लाइक हिंदू इन द वर्ल्ड देर इज ओनली ब्राह्मण इन द वर्ल्ड इंडियन स्ट्रेटेजिक कल्चर इज ऑल अबाउट ब्राह्मणिज्म द ब्राह्मणिज्म विच इज कास्ट बेस्ड सुप्रेमस वो दुनिया में जिस तरीके से यहूदियों का कॉन्सेप्ट है कि वी आर द चोजन पीपल इस तरीके से जो इंडिया में ब्राह्मण है दे थिंक दैट सेल्फ एज द चोजन पीपल एंड वंस यू आर इन क्लैश with certain communities it is not about hindus about the people who are from other caste it is only about <laughs> brahman kya karta hai is what their political elite their business elite their bureaucratic elite is all composed of <laughs> caste based brahman and sometimes you can pay some money to become that yes Wealthy people can do. It is not that strict system. You can always be start living in a in a higher neighborhood, have a lot of money with you, and people will start yeah, buy buy some people who will keep telling others. Yeah. Next, acha conception of Pakistan is a highly problematic area. Pakistan has been carved out of the mother India. It is called the Vibh section. Akhand Bharat, yeah, yes, it's not a dead concept. They say that you have basically mother, जो mother India है, उसको आपने card का एक उनका एक piece से लगा किया और it can only be recovered by undoing the. This is a living concept. ठीक है, इसको आपने भूलना नहीं है, ठीक है? Pakistan is not a geographical territory which has been acquired it is basically an idea pakistan is an idea, idea. just when i was talking you should have an idea that is how pakistan is the most dangerous country of the world not because that you have terrorists not because that you have nuclear weapon why aaj wo bajra why pakistan is the most dangerous country for which the americans are so worried That they are putting the entire CIA's budget in this country. We are the neighbor of China. We are the neighbor of China, and China is in love with America. <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever gone to America? You see, in the downtown, everything in America is Chinese. <laughs> they can never fight a war with China. Sorry, sir. They are in love with them. 
India, China, enemies, no sir, they are in love with each other. They trade, look at the trade, it is happening. These are skirmishes, you know, they are throwing some chingari. You have to see them from the back, where are they? These are some other stories. You should know, Pakistan is an idea. Remember this, I have to call you here, 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 I have to call you here. I'm trying to communicate to you that you should learn what I'm saying. Pakistan is an idea. Pakistan is an idea. Or this idea is a dangerous idea. Sir, I have a question. You're referring to the same ideology that mission theory. Is an idea or there is something else that you're referring to? Okay, look, Pakistan is made. Two streams have made Pakistan. Who made Pakistan? Who made those streams of स्ट्रगल्स ने बनाया याद रखें आपको पता है उनका वन दैट दे वो सेइंग दैट देर इज मेजॉरिटीरियनिज्म एंड इफ वी डू नॉट हैव आर ओन होमलैंड वी विल नॉट हैव आर ओन राइट्स द माइनॉरिटी राइट्स ठीक है वी विल बी माइनॉरिटी एंड आर राइट्स विल बी विल बी टेकन बाय द मेजॉरिटी ये वो लोग थे और ये काफी इनका बड़ा लॉजिकल सा आर्गुमेंट है कि जी कायदेआजम के सारे पॉइंट्स आप पढ़ने वो हमेशा ही क्या रहते हैं ना कि यार हमें सेपरेट इलेक्ट्रोनिक किया जाए माइनॉरिटी राइट्स को प्रोटेक्ट किया जाए यही करते हैं ना तो पाकिस्तान तो बना ही तो थोड़े से टाइम में बना था आपने तीन महीने बाद क्या था पहले तो जो निगोशिएटिंग और सेटन माइनॉरिटी they wanted to practice a different way of life. वो जो था उस दोनों ने merge होना था after 47 लेकिन हुआ ये कि they came very closer to each other and then parted started parting ways. ठीक है? तो खैर अंजू construction of Pakistan is highly problematic. It has to be understood in its true perspective. थोड़ा सा कभी वेले होके ना mobile से निकल के तो किताब पढ़े what is it? We don't have to do it. We are already knowledgeable. We have all the information on our fingertips. Good. Chitta Acha Kaupe get that. Pakistan is not in Kashmir. We don't have to say that. We don't have to say that. We have to say that. We have to say that. And we have to say that. We have to say that. अलामा इकबाल की लड़ाई शुरू कर देते हैं। अलामा इकबाल का दुबई अलाबाद किसने पढ़ाया पूरा हाथ करना? पूरा खुद बाला। पूरे 1015 और 30 बोले किसने पढ़े? ये यूनिवर्सिटी में जाकर उस्तादों से भी पूरे किसने नहीं पढ़े? ठीक है? किसी ने अगर वो पढ़ लिया होता ना तो ये सवाल तो बढ़ता ही नह वहाँ पर भी इसलिए मैं आपको बता रहा हूँ कि बड़ा ही highly sophisticated text, politically an excellent masterpiece, but एक audience के सामने पेश किया गया था not ready to listen. That was much more before its own time. आखर में लामा इकबाल को लोगों ने कहा साथ उसी या तकरीर ने काट किया और कुछ शेयर भी सुना। वहाँ पे एक world view लेते हैं इकबाल। और इकबाल कहते हैं जो duality है जो दुनिया में आमने एंथ्रोपोसेंट्रिज्म और थियोसेंट्रिज्म की बात की थी वहाँ से उन्होंने अपना उनका जो मास्टर थीसेस है एंड ही सेज दैट कि डी मैटर एंड स्पिरिट आर नॉट टू सेपरेट एंटिटी और से सुने हम ये कहते हैं ना कि दीन और दुनिया ठीक है वो कहते हैं मैटर एंड स्पिरिट आर नॉट टू सेपरेट एंटिटीज मैटर इज Matter, matter is the realization of the spirit in time and space because time and space के paradigm में आपको कुछ चीज को मायर करना observable phenomena बनाने के लिए spirit नहीं है रूप धारा हुआ है actually what is not visible is the real and what is visible is not the real it is only the reflection of the real ये एक बार का अलग बात का address है उसमें defence of India का भी पूरा chapter Please go back and read. आपने एक बार का सवाल पूछ के 
It is absolutely wrong. <laughs> absolutely wrong. There is no plutonium from Pluto. Pluto is out there, and nobody has brought any plutonium from Pluto. But actually, there was no plutonium on Earth. Yes, yes. It is an artificial matter. It is an artificial matter. It has been created in the reactor. Okay? There has never been plutonium before 1945. A lot of metal. I will tell you nuclear weapon is explosion, when it was discovered, man was able to conquer the matter. When the first matter ko transform kardiya from one element to the other element. Sari zindagi alchemy mein log lead ko kya banana cha rahe the? Gold. Gold mein convert karne ki koshish karte hai, lekin hamecha sari zindagi yehi kaam karte karte bohut se log mar gaye. Nuclear revolution has made it happen that you could break down the matter further ek element se do different kisam ke elements create kar diya. And what you got in the process? Energy. Okay, next if you go and tell me, tell me that you have to give me a Don't quote me in that. I just want to say it again. There is no plutonium from Pluto. Now you are going to say you're 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 going Nuclear weapons का जो doctrine है, it talks about the minimum credible. We will remain minimum. We will remain credible. Full spectrum is not about the nuclear weapon. It is about the threats. Any threat which emerges from all spectrum at the lowest level of pole star to the full scale war. ठीक है? If any state is going to engage Pakistan in any kind of warfare our nuclear deterrence at all level will be able to safeguard the national security. Okay? We have full spectrum ki definition. Full spectrum does not mean that Pakistan is going to use the tactical nuclear weapons and then we will use the operational nuclear weapons and then we will use the strategic No. We will deal with even the tactical nuclear weapon is a wrong term. It is the battlefield nuclear weapons will the seal will always be at the strategic level. Okay? Technical nuclear weapons only is a wrong term, never used, try to use the other word, that is the battlefield nuclear weapon, and of course, they have no utility at all. It is only to counter an idea with another idea. The idea was that there is a space of war at the, at the lower end, below the nuclear threshold. Then somebody start thinking about that, how to do about this. If a person in the mind has a wrong idea, then what is the trick? What is the trick? What is the trick? What is the trick? Idea enforced. So Indians started thinking that there is a space of war below the nuclear threshold. So here we came, we said, okay, you come on, and we are going to use a tactical nuclear weapon on that small kind of objective. One of the ideas itself is an absurd idea. If there is no military strategy, there is no discussion, then we will sit there and see how can we use the, the instrument of war to <coughs> aim for shallow objectives at multiple shallow objectives with no political end. The political end in this court start is basically they want to say that they want to punish Pakistan for interfering inside India. So that is the kind of story. Pakistan also has presented India with a strategic restraint regime. But we still maintain that, that the ballistic weapons, nuclear weapons should not be deployed. There should not be operationalization of the weapons, the mating which Salisa was talking, that the delivery meals should be stored separately from the weapons. And the weapons should be disassembled form so that the core of the missile material is positioned outside. So that is how it gives the reaction time to deploy the nuclear weapons. It will take time. Our geographical contiguity here. So there is a less of early warning and then there is a problem of uh, if we use the nuclear weapons to the side of the to assess the time. So we have to go back. Okay. And then uh, non pre-notification of missile tests, declaration of non-acquisition of deployment of AVM. So we say that Pakistan thinks 
that ballistic missile defense is actually a destabilizing technology should not be introduced into the system. If you introduce it gives a wrong idea to the enemy that we will be able to absorb the first strike and or we will be able to absorb the second strike and we can then it, it gives the confidence of a preemptive strike. That is dangerous between two nuclear weapons. Yes. 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 So we have our command authority. The only difference between Pakistan's nuclear command authority and the Indian nuclear uh, command authority is that the Employment Control Committee has the three services chief and table joint chief as part of the members. It is headed by the chairman, prime minister, a civilian. What is the role of the military? In America, in UK, in Russia, in China, in France, the custodial control of the nuclear weapon is always with the मुझे बताएं कि क्या आप चाहते हैं कि न्यूक्लियर वेपन जो है वो सीडीए के किसी स्टोर में पड़े होने चाहिए हाँ जहाँ से प्राइम मिनिस्टर अपनी गाड़ी में जाए और उनको पीछे बैक में लोड करे और पार्लियामेंट में जा के लाल में खड़ा करे और चुड़ी लगा के कहे जो ये हो गया
ये बेसिक चीजें एक्चुअली अपने टेक्नोलॉजी रिलेटेड जो है ये भी पता होनी चाहिए सोशल साइंटिस्ट को भी सिर्फ ये साइंटिस्ट का डोमेन नहीं है बिकॉज आपका एनालिसिस इनकम्प्लीट रह जाता है अगर आपको ये टेक्निकलिटीज का पता ना और ये कोई ऐसी मुश्किल बात नहीं है अगर हम लोग सीख सकते हैं तो आप भी सीख सकते हैं आज ये भी क्वेश्चंस आप अभी हाउस में बहुत बड़ा डिस्कशन बड़े पुराने हैं कि आप पॉसिबिलिटी यू कैन क्या प्रेसिडेंट ओबामा का कि उन्होंने जीरो ग्लोबल जीरो का वो दिया था इस पे नोबेल प्राइस भी उसको ना मिली हुआ लेकिन जब उसकी पोस्ट चला है 2010 एंड 2018 तो ये दोनों कंट्रीडिक्टरी नहीं है सर जात में कि एक दफा वो जीरो इमिशन की बात कर रहे हैं दूसरी तरफ कहते हैं कि राइजिंग चाइना जो है तो फ्यूचर क्या होगा न्यूक्लियर वर्ल्ड का एक्चुअली ही वाज रियलिस्टिक अनफ टू से दैट ऑल्दो माय ऑब्जेक्टिव इज टू इमिशन बट ही आल्सो एडेड that i don't see any possibility of this happening at least in my lifetime yes so that means uh, he was in his 40s to america mein life expectancy 80s mein hai to at least 40 50 saal tak to he didn't see any possibility yet he was given a nobel peace prize for this hypothetical situation but the fact of the matter is that anything once learned cannot be unlearned iske upar bada realistic ek assessment thi margaret thatcher ki who was one time prime minister of uk jisko iron lady bhi kehte the so she said that nuclear weapons are not going to go away even if we dismantle all the nuclear weapons which are existing in the world at the moment what is going to happen is that whenever there is a prolonged conflict between two countries both will secretly start activating their nuclear labs and nuclear test sites start rebuilding because uh, the knowledge is there the materials are there designs are there and everybody will start building nuclear weapons thinking that the others may not take a lead and change the uh, balance uh, in the war so uh, they will revive so they are not never going to go away totally so even if you uh, uh, remove the current stockpile they can be recreated because that knowledge is there and as i said the ideas and knowledge cannot be destroyed they remain forever we can work futuristic technologies ki tarah कौन सी टेक्नोलॉजी फ्यूचरिस्टिक जो टेक्नोलॉजीज हैं उनकी तरफ बेसिकली व्हाट आई थिंक इज दैट न्यूक्लियर वेपन इज नॉट द लिमिट राइट सो इफ न्यूक्लियर वेपन इज नॉट द लिमिट तो कुछ ऐसी टेक्नोलॉजीज हैं फॉर एग्जांपल अगर हम हैवी मेटल मशीन से उनके रॉड्स या कॉलम्स को इफ वी लिफ्ट देम अप टू स्पेस एंड रिलीज देम बैक टू योर एनिमी तो इट इट वुड बी अ हेवन टू योर एनिमी बट जिस तरह के अनलाइक न्यूक्लियर वेपन्स वहाँ पे हमारे पास रेडिएशन प्रॉब्लम है वहाँ पे हमारे पास ऐसी डिजास्टर्स किस्म की एक डेवस्टेशन है जो कि आपके लिए वहाँ पे रिहेबिलिटेशन का प्रोसेस नहीं कर सकती लेकिन जो चीज़ मैं जिसका जिक्र कर रहा हूँ इसके अंदर ये है कि इट वुड बी आर क्लीन डिस्ट्रक्शन सो वाई नॉट वर्किंग ऑन दिस अगर हमने वॉर की बात ही करनी है अब स्पेस की वेपनाइजेशन के ऊपर बैन तो है लेकिन हमने न्यूक्लियर वेपन भी तो एन के बाद ही एक्वायर किया तो वे क्वेश्चन वुड बी <coughs> there are certain technologies that are theoretically possible there are some which are available to be used they are operationalized already and that nuclear weapons are one of those they are operationalized they are usable and the deterrence effect created by nuclear weapons is because of the fact that there is a possibility of the use if there is zero possibility of use of nuclear weapons they will not deter so there has to be possibility of use that in certain uh, situations they can be used now all these ideas of uh, first of all there is a uh, lot of opposition to the idea of militarization of space some people say that it is it is already militarized and some people say it is not because it's a technical issue 
does militarization of space include basing some weapons on heavenly bodies in space or does it mean uh, some connection with the weapons on ground? For instance, all these precision guided missiles these days, they get their guidance signals from GPS, which is satellite based in space. So it is not a weapon, it is a weapon system which has its target acquisition capability, guidance capability and command and control which is on ground. That command and control and guidance is controlled by the satellites in space which is part of that whole weapon system. So from that point of view space is already weaponized because a component of a weapon system is already in space. Similarly, once you fire long-range ballistic missiles, temporarily at least part of their flight, one-third of the flight, they pass through the space. So for that time, there's a weapon existing in space as long as that missile is traveling through space. So those kind of issues are there. There were a lot of ideas like brilliant pebbles. What you are brilliant pebbles was idea. Tha. Because if you throw something from there, it will gravitational pull. It will gain so much momentum that it can cause damage. Lekin, on the other side, if you see the lot of uh, these uh, meteors, they fall from space towards the earth and not all of them reach and impact the ground. They are burnt away while they are coming down because of the friction of the air once they move from space to the earth atmosphere. So uh, the biggest problem is that if you place anything in space and launch it from there, uh, chances are that it will be burnt away, it won't be able to reach its target. One, second is they also, uh, as part of the SDI, the Star Wars program of Reagan. They thought of uh, deploying lasers in space and also particle beams, but they realized that because of the difference in magnetic field of space and the Earth atmosphere, they will not come in straight, they will bend. And they will bend at their different, so it will be difficult to focus on a particular point. So there are a lot of difficulties, it's not that easy. Otherwise people would have tried it and uh, uh, there was an idea at some time to base some nuclear weapons on the moon itself. But then how to deliver it from there, uh, that is uh, a big question. Uh, because even if you deliver it, how do you control its movement because the, the space is a very uh, thin medium, it's not a thick medium. Uh, there is no resistance, but the moment you enter from that medium into Earth atmosphere, there is resistance and then the gravitational pull keeps increasing because of which uh, the things will not remain intact. Uh, you know that if the missile technology initially, uh, in early stages, once people fire the missiles, if it does not have a proper uh, metal used in the re-entry vehicle. It tends to uh, either split or burn away once it re-enters into space. It does not reach the target. So that is the kind of thing which happens because those forces are very strong which act on it. Ji. Sir, you have talked about the political will of credibility. So if we look at the concept of debt then Pakistan and India अकेले कंट्रीज नहीं है उसके साथ चाइना का भी फैक्टर आता है पाकिस्तान जितने रिलेशन चाइना के साथ स्ट्रॉन्ग करता है इंडिया उसको थ्रेट कंसीडर करता है और उस रिटेलिएशन के तौर पे वो अपनी इकोनॉमी को ज्यादा स्ट्रेंथन करता है जो पाकिस्तान के लिए एक फेलियर है और दूसरा हमारा डोमेस्टिक स्ट्रक्चर भी इस तरह का हो चुका है कि अब हमें लगता है कि हमारा जो पॉलिटिकल लीडरशिप है या पॉलिटिकल विल की जो आप बात करते हैं वो थोड़ा सा हेजिटेट फील करता है टुवर्ड्स इंडिया तो ऐसा नहीं है कि अगर हम अपनी टेंशंस थोड़ी बहुत यूएस की तरफ डाइवर्ट करें क्योंकि उसने मुझे ऐसे लगता है मेरी पर्सनल परसेप्शन है 
اس نے ہمیں ہر حال میں سپورٹ کیا ہے انڈینس کے یونیورسٹیز کے اندر یہ پڑھایا جاتا ہے کہ یو ایس پاکستان کے بیک اینڈ پہ ہوتا ہے آل دو ٹیرزم کا چیپٹر آ جاتا ہے وہاں پہ تھوڑی ڈسٹربنس ہو جاتی ہے باقی یو ایس اور پاکستان کی کافی افیلیشن اسٹرانگ رہی ہے تو اگر ہم چائنا کو لوپ میں رکھیں لیکن سیکنڈ اپرچونیٹی کے طور پہ اور اپنی جو پرائرٹیز ہیں وہ یو ایس اور اس کے ماڈلس کی طرف لے کے جائیں تو اس اس میں انڈیا کو بھی ڈیٹر فیل ہوگا ہماری اکانومی بھی تھوڑی اسٹیبل ہوگی اور پھر ہمارا یورپی یونین کا وہ جو کانسیپٹ ہے وہ بھی تھوڑا اسٹرانگ ہوگا ہمارا جو پاکستان میں سب اپرسیپشن یہ ہے کہ جی آپ میرے دوست ہیں ان کے ساتھ میری لڑائی ہے تو آپ بھی ان کے ساتھ کٹی کر لیں آپ ان کے ساتھ بات نہ کریں اٹ ڈزنٹ ہیپن ان انٹرنیشنل اسٹیٹس فالو دیئر اون نیشنل انٹرس امیرکا ہیز نو لو لاس وتھ پاکستان آئی گیو یو سم ہسٹری ان نائنٹین once Indian subcontinent was about to be partitioned, Americans had a representative in Delhi and they tried their best to persuade the British not to partition the subcontinent, not to create Pakistan. They wanted India to remain a single entity so that they could use it for their future uh, purposes. But once it happened, They immediately sent an ambassador to Delhi. They took one year to send their ambassador to Karachi. And if you look at the history of ambassadors, in Pakistan, invariably, we have had the carrier diplomats, who are bureaucrats, who follow their dictate, which is given to them. Whereas in India, most of the uh, ambassadors which came, they were political nominees. The political nominees have an advantage that they have links with the uh, political leadership and they have greater access, they can bypass the bureaucracy. As happened in case of Robert Blackwell, once he was in India and he had Ashley Tennis as his, uh, as his advisor, they were the ones who were the architects of India USD. Because Blackwell, if he faced any problem, he would not go through state department, he will straight away pick up the phone and talk to President Bush because he was his person oh, bothering to consult Pakistan, who was their close ally. And both British and the Americans, they came and they gave them so much of equipment which was enough to raise nine mountain divisions. And the Indians requested for Uh, sending 40 squadrons, Nehru requested for sending 40 squadrons of American Air Force to defend Indian airspace. And everybody talks about uh, the Enterprise Task Force coming to Bay of Bengal in 71 to help Pakistan. Nobody, no Indian, no American will talk to you about the fact that in 1962 a similar task force was sent by Americans to Bay of Bengal to help India. And after that, they had a soft corner for India. They told the Yuk Khan during 62 war not to bother India because Indians worried that once they are fighting China, Pakistan may attack uh, in Kashmir and take away uh, uh, some territory in Kashmir. So Americans put pressure on Pakistan not to do this on the promise that once the war with China ends, we will persuade India to talk to you. And as a result, in 1963, there was this uh, dialogue which we were famously known as the Bhutto Swan Singh talks of taking interest. And no, nothing came out of those talks. After the 64 Chinese uh, test, the Americans had greater sympathy for India. Right at the beginning of the 60s, they knew in, in which direction Indian nuclear program is going. And all their assessments of CIA and the scientific community indicated that India is going to develop a nuclear weapon capability sooner or later. And after the Chinese test, the Americans said, we don't want India to go nuclear, but if they go nuclear, we understand their compulsions because they have a threat from China. And they had assured India 
that in case of a nuclear threat from China through your delivery systems, it was uh, even suggested in one of the governmental uh, studies which was sent to the president by the State Department. It was suggested that India had a pre-eminent position in the third world because of its technological advancement. After China's test, its position has been uh, lowered and it is confidence has been shaken. So let's give one of our nuclear devices to be detonated on Indian soil so that India's confidence and its prestige is restored. And at, at the same time, they were saying we should give everything to India while making sure that India's non-aligned position is not uh, uh, compromised. So that has been the American attitude throughout. So let's be very clear about it. Whenever their interests coincided with us, they came running to us, as it happened in 79. 79 April, Carter had imposed sanctions on Pakistan because of Pakistan nuclear program. Twice they had put sanctions on Pakistan, and once in December 79, Russians came into Afghanistan, the Americans came running to us with that 400 uh, million package and everything. After that war ended, they went back and then uh, imposed the uh, restless sanctions. Once 9-11 happened, they again came back to you. Once they have gone from Afghanistan, they are no more interested in Pakistan. And we unfortunately have sold ourselves cheap to America always. We gave them Bada Bear uh, uh, air base facility free of cost from their, where they are flying their spy planes and which went to Russia. One of them was shot down on Russia and Khrushchev, Russian Prime Minister, had threatened Pakistan that I have put a red circle around Peshawar. And, but we went along with the Americans. Later on, uh, uh, after 9-11, we allowed them the air corridor, we allowed them the land communication without any cost. Even if we had imposed ten dollars per container and a few dollars per flight, what they uh, keep telling us that we have given you thirty-two billion dollars and whatever, and we saan aapke upar karte hain. Actually, they would have owed you double that amount, maybe more. Hamne muft mein sab kuch de diya, aur wo aapke upar saan chhate ki hamne dekhe ji tere paise aapko de diye, fir bhi aap jo hai hamare saath dhoka karte. So that is the reality, and we should understand that. India in, uh, in, uh, always had relations with the Soviet Union, but they kept doors open with, to the West also. Abhi bhi wo ye kar rahe hai, ki America is a strategic partnership hai, tel Russia se sasta khareed rahe hai. Weapons, 50% unki abhi bhi Russia se aare hai, Sipri ki reports dek le. So they keep their options open. हम अपने एग्स ए की बास्केट में डाल देते हैं और फिर हम फंस जाते हैं। We need to have good relations, workable relations with everybody. A Yu Khan जैसा बंदा who had gone out of the way to reach the Americans, at some stage he was also frustrated, which led him to write that book. आप पढ़ें बट वर्थ रीडिंग। Title उसका है Friends Not Masters. That we want friends, we don't want masters. Kind of a message which Imran is giving these days. Friend not masters. Uska Urdu tajma bhi hai. Jis riz se aati ho parwaz mein kutahi. Wo padhe aap zhuroor kitab. Wo padhe wali hai. Interestingly, I was I am reading a book these days and there was a very interesting anecdote that in the after around 1966. An American ambassador was posted to Pakistan and he was so arrogant and brash that he wouldn't bother and he would ask for a meeting with the president and the president would always oblige him. But he was so uh, rude that whenever he would come and while entering the president's office, he would be having a cigar in his mouth, smoking and getting uh, in uh, while smoking, without asking the uh, having the courtesy to ask, sir, can I continue to smoke? And he would come and then he would bring a folder 
of newspaper clippings and hand it over to President Ayub and saying that, look, these are the empty American news and editorials being published in Pakistani press. So that has been their attitude, they think they are viceroys. And uh, we treat them as such. Uh, our leaders also, if you have read the Wiki Leaks, you will get a lot of messages in the Telegram, in which we have a lot of our leaders, Maulana and others, and they say that we have made the Prime Minister, we will do whatever we say, we will do it for the service. This is on record. American documents. Sir, you have to say that the American documents are declassified. So, that's why we should not have any wrong notions. We should be very clear. But the fact is, you have to put your own house in order. If your house is not in order, nobody will respect you. जिस घर में झगड़ा हो, जिस घर में पार्टी बाजी हो, उसके हम साये भी उसकी इज्जत नहीं करते, और मल्ले में भी कोई इज्जत नहीं करता। तो आप अपनी इकोनॉमी सीधी करें, अपने इंस्टीट्यूशंस को स्ट्रॉंग करें। आप क्या भी जुडिशरी का डू यू थिंक दुनिया असली नहीं है? पीपल आर नॉट ब that is why our judiciary is at 129 uh, in the world uh, in, in terms of rating. Kisliye? Because people see what is happening. So, when this mulk mein justice na ho, this mulk mein merit na ho, this the economy na chal rahi ho, this mein corruption rampant ho, this mein koi institution kaam ka karti ho, to phir aapki bahar bhi zhati ho. जब आप ये चीजें सीधी करें इंडिया से क्यों अट्रैक्शन उनको तो वो उनके जेबे भरी हुई हैं वो अनाउंस करते हैं कि वी आर गोइंग टू परचेज 126 एयरक्राफ्ट फोर जेनरेशन एयरक्राफ्ट पूरी दुनिया की राल टपकना शुरू हो जाती है अमेरिकन्स कहते हैं कि एफ 16 ले ले हम यहाँ प्लांट लगा देते हैं एफ 18 � और वो उनको इस हमें भी देने को तैयार है लेकिन आपके पास कैश होना चाहिए हम कहते हैं कि हमें उधार दो पहले फिर हम आपसे चीज खरीदेंगे फिर किस्तों में दाख करेंगे तो इसलिए हमें न्यूक्लियर टेक्नोलॉजी भी कोई नहीं देता स्वाहे चाइना के और ना ही तैयार को देता है क्योंकि हमारे पास तो पैसे नहीं है इंडिया की जेबें भरी हुई हैं तो सबको लालच आता है उसके ऊपर ओबामा जब आया था तो उसने बड़ी उसमें प्राउडली कहा था कि जी आई एम uh, one ten billion dollars of Indian investment in in America. Or Bahajo Unki congressional hearings I attended one or two. This may condo condi rice kati thika ji America is a America or India ki nuclear deal is the Zuri hai. Is ke baad agar India do nuclear power plant be upset ridega, it will be worth ten billion dollars, which will mean three thousand uh, five thousand jobs for two years or three years. In those states, जहाँ ये प्लांट, जहाँ ये मैन्युफैक्चर होंगे, this is how they look at it. तो फिर आप आप अपना वो देखें ना स्टेटस, तो पहले अपना हाउसिंग ऑर्डर करें, फिर बाहर की तरफ देखें। दूसरों से आप गिला करेंगे कि जी आप हमारे साथ बीएम भी करें, तो आप अपने आप को तो पहले ठीक करें ना। That is the problem with us. जी। Sir, my name is talk about debtors, and in that we said that. That is somehow preventing someone taking such such step of uh, your action or what you are So, what is the basic difference between uh, deterrence and compellence? Okay. Both of them are related uh, to having a power. And sir, how much successful the concept of deterrence is keeping Russia-Ukraine conflict in view, or keeping uh, nuclear weapon states and not non-nuclear weapon states in view? Sir? There is a fine difference. Deterrence is meant to prevent an undesirable action, okay? whereas compellence is to force somebody to take an action which you want. Difference समझ आ गया? ठीक है ना? Deterrence ये है कि मैं यहाँ threat आपको pose करूँ, तो आप खुद ही डर के तो उठ के बाहर निकल जाएँ यहाँ से। Compellence ये है कि मैं आपको बाजू से पकड़ के बाहर निकाल दूँ। अब उसके लिए ज़्यादा ताकत चाहिए compellence के लिए। so compellence is difficult to achieve. You have to have a preponderant superiority of power uh, to achieve compellence. Deterrence can easily be achieved, but compellence cannot be. 
डिटेरेंस की एग्जाम्पल मैं आपको देता हूँ कि वंस फ्रांस डिवेलप्ड इट्स न्यूक्लियर केपेबिलिटी इन दिक्कटीज इट केम अप विद कॉन्सेप्ट ऑफ प्रोपोर्शनेट डिटेरेंस क्योंकि लोगों ने कहा कि जी रशिया के पास तो थाउजेंड ऑफ वेपन्स हैं तो आपके पास थोड़े से हैं तो आप कैसे रशिया को डिटेर करेंगे तो उन्होंने कॉन्सेप्ट दिया प्रोपोर्शनेट डिटेरेंस का विच मैं सेट के इफ दे कैन किल अस and we have the ability to cut off one of their arms or legs that should deter them kyunki apna bazu taan to koi nahi katana chahega to isliye wo deterrence aur compliance ka jo hai na wo ye fark aa jata hai deterrence is easier to achieve even with a small percentage of the power of uh, other uh, uh, opponent you can achieve deterrence but for compliance you have to have a superiority of power sir ab yahan se jo question hai ko part rahe hai aapka yes sir from university university uh, i just want to know uh, because there was so much uh, debate about this that pakistan's nuclear weapons are not safe for the world like the comment by the uh, mr president biden so i just want to know as you have been part of the system and policy making side as well is our system that weak or is it just a small comment which was done during that session uh, which he attended or do we need to be uh, you know skeptic about this or wa was it just a political statement okay. that he made okay. uh, because there are some people around my circle who are of the view that pakistan uh, you know is vulnerable of terrorism and all so there are some actors which are you know actively taking part in some sort of you know okay what so what what, what question is we are a nuclear weapon state but we have not learned to behave like a self assured and confident nuclear power zara sa koi baat karta hai new york time mein ek a jata hai article washington post mein koi likh deta hai koi hindustan time mein likh deta hai to hame musibat pad jati hai और दूसरा प्रॉब्लम हमारा अंग्रेजी का है अब मेरे जैसे उर्दू मीडियम लोग हमें अंग्रेजी समझ नहीं आती ना हम गौर से पढ़ने की कोशिश करते हैं और फॉरन रिएक्ट करना शुरू कर देते हैं जज्बाती तो हैं हम लोग तो होता क्या है अब बाइडेन का स्टेटमेंट क्या था ई सेड पाकिस्तान इज ए डेंजरस कंट्री बिकॉज इट हैज न्यूक्लियर वेपन एंड एन अनस्टेबल सिस्टम ई वॉज नॉट talking about the state of safety and security of nuclear weapons he was talking about the political confusion in pakistan and the weakness of the institutions ke weapons to hain agar institution aapki kharab hai political jo hai wo turmoil hai to phir hi khatra paida ho sakta hai theek hai he didn't say anything directly about weakness in the safety security of nuclear weapons humne usko wo interpret karke तो एक दूसरे से मुकाबले पे आके बड़े से बड़े बयान देने शुरू कर दिए और सब कुछ अगर उसको दोबारा आप स्टेटमेंट को निकाल के पढ़ें तो आपको समझ आ जाएगी कि वो किस कॉन्टेक्स में क्या बात थी लेकिन हमने उसको हमें अपने दिल में चोर होता है ना हमेशा कि यार हमारे न्यूक्लियर वेपन को उठा के ले जाएगा इसको मैं कहता हूं कोहटा सिंड्रोम हम लोग कोहटा सिंड्रोम से नहीं निकले वो एटीज में होता था ना कि जी वो इंडियन आर प्लानिंग एन अटैक उनको होता इजराइलीज आर प्लानिंग एन अटैक अमेरिकन आर प्लानिंग एन अटैक वहां हमने एंटी एयरक्राफ्ट मिसाइल लगाए होते बलून लगाए होते वगैरह वगैरह नाउ दैट वाज अ स्टेज हमारा प्रोग्राम बिल्ड अप हो रहा था मटीरियल वहां प्रोड्यूस हो रहा था जब मटीरियल प्रोड्यूस होकर वहां से निकल गया वेपन में कन्वर्ट हो गया स्टोरेज साइट में चला गया अब कोटा पे कोई अटैक करता रहे तो हमारे प्रोग्राम पे तो कोई फर्क नहीं पड़ेगा ना केपेबिलिटी पे पड़ेगा लेकिन हम उस माइंडसेट से नहीं निकले कि कोई आएगा और छीन के ले जाएगा चोरी करके ले जाएगा वगैरह वगैरह ये आई रिमेंबर आई वाज इन वाशिंगटन में मुझे बीबीसी वालों ने एक फोन किया ये 2007 नवंबर की बात है उन दिनों यही इस तरह की बड़ी खबरें चल रही थी कि अमेरिकन स्पेशल फोर्सेज आर प्रिपेयरिंग टू कम एंड टेक अवे पाकिस्तान वेपन तो बीबीसी वालों ने मुझे टेलीफोन किया वहां से लंदन से उन्होंने कहा जी आप बताएं कि ये खबरें जो चल रही हैं व्हाट डू यू हैव टू से ऑन दिस 
कि अमेरिकन स्पेशल फोर्सेस जो है वो तैयारी कर रही है जाके पाकिस्तान के न्यूक्लियर वेपन्स को कब्जा करने के लिए तो मैंने कहा माई क्वेश्चन टू यू इज इज पाकिस्तान आर्मी ऑन लीव क्या मतलब मैंने कहा बात यह है कि अगर छह लाख आर्मी है पाकिस्तान की और दो सौ तीन सौ आदमी बाहर से आके पाकिस्तान के वेपन को कब्जा करके ले जाएंगे इज इट दैट सिंपल तो वो चुप कर गया फिर उसने कहा कि अच्छा इफ दे ट्राई टू अटैक यूर न्यूक्लियर इंस्टोलेशन एंड न्यूक्लियर साइट विद एरियल अटैक्स मैंने कहा दे वुड है लॉन्ग टाइम अगो इफ दे कुड He said, uh, "We know that the possibility of success of such an attack uh, could be low, but if somebody still mistakenly uh, uh, carries out such an attack, what will be your response and what will happen?" I said, "Americans have forces in Afghanistan. They have a naval fleet in the Arabian Sea. They have bases in the Middle East, all within the range of our missiles." So if they attempt such an attack, whatever will be left will be directed at, at all these targets, and that was the end of the interview. The point is, you should have to have confidence in your capability and be able to respond. If you are defensive, or no, 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 we have done all this. It is not like that. We have done a lot of explaining. Now, if you are coming, you are coming. This is such a thing. 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 वो स्टेटमेंट दे रहे हैं अनफॉर्चुनेटली नॉट ओनली दी चलो पॉलिटिशियन को नहीं पता होता टेक्निकल चीजों का एक असिस्टेंट प्रोफेसर साहब है नबल में मैं उनका नाम ही लेना चाहता उन्होंने भी इंटरव्यू यूट्यूब के ऊपर दाग दिया कि जी आई ये नहीं इंस्पेक्ट की हुए हैं हमारी वेपन साइट तो दे आर सेटिस्फाइड वो आई ए हैज नथिंग टू डू विद वेपन इट हैज टू डू विद पीसफुल यूज ऑफ न्यूक्लियर टेक्नोलॉजी वो तो न्यूक्लियर पावर प्लांट वगैरह के साथ उनका डोमेन है ये तो उनके डोमेन में नहीं आते And what uh, uh, authority IAEA has to inspect our nuclear weapons? So, in this way, the Prime Minister has said that the foreign people have come and they have inspected many times and they are satisfied that our safety is good. These are very different things. We have institutional mechanisms in place. Pakistan Nuclear Regulatory Authority was established in early 2001. Although its domain is वो है ऑन ऑल न्यूक्लियर इंस्टोलेशन विच आर नॉन वेपन रिलेटेड पावर प्लांट्स हैं रिसर्च रिएक्टर्स हैं और मेडिकल सेंटर्स हैं ऑल दोज काइंड ऑफ थिंग्स द सिक्योरिटी ऑफ द न्यूक्लियर वेपन्स पार्ट ऑफ इट और कब जनरल द एन सी ए एंड पार्ट ऑफ एन सी ए इज ए सिक्योरिटी डिवीजन विच हैज थर्टी थाउजेंड पीपल स्पेशली रिक्रूटेड ट्रेन ऑन dealing with any such emergency so the part of it is based on static installation storage sites where wahan wo perimeter defense ke liye hain there is a quick reaction force rapid reaction force which can be lifted by aircraft and helicopters and landed at any emergency uh, situation within half an hour there is a maritime uh, element to that also and then there are counter intelligence teams all around which keep an eye on any threat to any nuclear station so there is a very comprehensive system layered system hai defenses ka to isliye usme koi shak shubha ki baat nahi hai and the american know it very well unko pata hai halanki unke mulk mein jo security hai unki nuclear stations ki it is with the private contractors vacan hat wagera unke paas hai unke aisi koi force nahi hai जितनी पाकिस्तान की कैपेबिलिटी है या पाकिस्तान ने इन्वेस्टमेंट की है न्यूक्लियर सेफ्टी सिक्योरिटी में किसी दुनिया के मुल्क ने नहीं की इंडिया की एक है इंडस्ट्रियल सिक्योरिटी फोर्स इट्स अ सेकंड लाइन फोर्स पुलिस से भी नीचे है जो नॉर्मल इंडस्ट्रीज को करती है वो ही न्यूक्लियर स्टेशन को भी प्रोटेक्शन प्रोवाइड करती है दे डोंट हैव एनी थिंग एनी वेयर कंपेयर टू पाकिस्तान तो हमें इसमें कॉन्फिडेंस होना चाहिए वी शुड बी प्राउड ऑफ इट और कोई अगर कहता है तो आपने बहुत एक्सप्लेनेशन दे दी है किसी मुल्क ने एक्सप्लेनेशन नहीं दी कि हमारी न्यूक्लियर सिक्योरिटी ठीक है होता क्या है कि यहाँ जो है वो हमारे अपने लोग पीपल लाइक प्रोफेसर रूद भाई उन्होंने लिख दिया कि जी बेनजीर पे अटैक हुआ जी 
जाओ लाख का जहाज गिर गया तो पाकिस्तान की न्यूक्लियर सिक्योरिटी कैसे जो है ना सेफ हाथों में है तो भाई पेंटागॉन पे जो अटैक हुआ था तो अमेरिकन न्यूक्लियर वेपन सेफ है जी एच क्यू पर अटैक हो गई तो वेपन जी एच क्यू में थोड़ी पड़े हुए हैं लंडन में अंडरग्राउंड पर अटैक हो गया तो उनके ब्रिटेन के वेपन को थ्रेट हो गई पाकिस्तान में जाना वो चांगा मांगा में कुछ हो जाएगा तो कहेंगे जी वेपन को थ्रेट होगी तो इसलिए हमें क्लियर होना चाहिए कि वट इज थ्रेट एंड वट इज नॉट एक चीज वी शुड एक्नोलेज एंड बी फेयर अबाउट इट एनी बॉडी सींग पाकिस्तान फ्रॉम ए डिस्टेंस वो देखेगा कि एक एक तमाशा बना हुआ है ना एक एक कंफ्यूजन है हर तरफ सड़कों पे जाए उधर देखे जहाँ जाए एक हर जगह पे जो है ना वो तमाशा फैजाबाद के पुल के ऊपर सुबह खड़े हो जाए देखें ट्रैफिक तो आप कहेंगे कि इन लोगों के पास जो है ना ये वेपन आ गई है क्या करेंगे इनके साथ क्योंकि वो बसों के पीछे स्टूडेंट लटके हुए हैं और क्या क्या आपको चीज़ें नजर आती हैं वो सेफ्टी सिक्योरिटी का हमारे जहन में कॉन्सेप्ट ही नहीं है उसको देख के लोग डरते हैं जरूर कि यार ये लोग जो इनकी ये हालत है ये एटीट्यूड है लाइफ की तरफ इनका खंबे के ऊपर चढ़े हुए हैं बगैर किसी बेल्ट के बगैर रबड़ के ग्लास पहने हुए और वो जनाब वो बिजली की तारें ठीक कर रहे हैं या मैं देखा होगा कई दफा तो ये टावर के ऊपर जो टेलीकॉम टावर कितने ऊंचे होते हैं उनके ऊपर वो रिगर चढ़ रहे होते हैं उनकी कोई सेफ्टी नहीं है कोई सेफ्टी बेल्ट नहीं है कोई कुछ नहीं है और किसी ने पॉइंट आउट किया बाई सन वॉज वर्किंग इन टेलीकॉम कंपनी सेट की जी ये इनके प्रोटेक्टिव गेयर होना चाहिए इसके बगैर इतना चढ़ते होने कहा जी कोई बात नहीं गिर जाएंगे तो अब नहीं छोरा से इनकी कराई हुई है तो इनके घर वालों को पैसे मिल जाएंगे तो दैट इज दी एटीट्यूड तो जब ये लोग देखते हैं तो कहते हैं कि यार ये तो फिटलिस्टिक लोग हैं और फिर हम कहते हैं जो वो ठीक है जी मर गया और टाइम ही उसका लिखा हुआ था वक्त आ गया था इसलिए मर गया तो चाहे वो गाड़ी वाला नीचे दे गया तो कह जी वो तो उसका वक्त लिखी हुई थी उसका टाइम ही ऐसा था तो जब ये अप्रोच देते लोग कहते हैं कि वेपन्स को कैसे संभालेंगे तो पता नहीं क्या करेंगे उनके साथ तो फिर उनके लिए इट इज डिफरेंट डिफिकल्ट टू कॉम्प्रीहेंड कि इन द मिड्स ऑफ ऑल दिस कन्फ्यूजन एक आईलैंड ऑफ स्टेबिलिटी एक ऐसा है कि जहाँ ये वेपन बड़े प्रोटेक्टेड और बड़े सिस्टमेटिक तरीके से रखे हुए हैं सो दैट इज वाई पीपल फाइंड इट डिफिकल्ट टू एक्सेप्ट दिस रियलिटी बट इट इज हाउ इट इज दिस इज रियलिटी ऑफ पाकिस्तान सो वी नीड टू इम्प्रूव आर ओवरऑल इमेज तो ये चीजें खुद बहुत खत्म हो जी वाजपेई को इनवाइट किया था नवाज शरीफ ने पाकिस्तान आने के लिए तो दिस शोज लैक ऑफ कोऑर्डिनेशन बिटवीन पॉलिटिकल एंड मिलिट्री इंस्टीट्यूशन ठीक है कारगिल ऑपरेशन वाज ऑलरेडी अंडर वे ठीक है वो सर्दियों में शुरू हो चुका था दिसंबर नवंबर दिसंबर में एंड सम पीपल क्लेम दैट इन फेबर जब वो आया वाजपेई तो उससे पहले नवाज शरीफ को वहाँ लेके भी गए थे और उसको ब्रीफिंग दी थी और उसने कहा कि जनरल साहब फिर श्रीनगर की सैर कब करा रहे हैं मुझे ठीक है और वो भूल गया फिर क्योंकि वो पाँच मिनट की मेमोरी थी उसकी होती तो उसने वाजपेई को बुला लिया बगैर सोचे समझे जब बुला लिया तो अब उधर तो वो ऑपरेशन तो था उसको आपने विड्रॉ तो नहीं करना था फोर्सेज को और उधर वो आपके साथ एम और एग्रीमेंट साइन करके चला गया बाद में दो महीने के बाद वो कारगिल ऑपरेशन डिस्कवर हो गया जो वहाँ लोग बैठे हुए थे तो उन्होंने कहा जी आपने हमें स्टैप किया बैग में ठीक है इंटरनेशनल सर्कल में क्या हमारी इतनी स्ट्रॉन्ग पॉलिसीज हैं या गुड जस्टर है क्योंकि हमने तो सिर्फ वॉर्स और अब तो अभिनंदन वाले देखो बात वही जो मैं कर रहा था ना बात फोकस पे अटेंशन टू वट आई से इफ योर ओन हाउस इज नॉट इन ऑर्डर आपकी बात की बाहर कोई वैल्यू नहीं होती है ठीक है ये मसला है हमारा इंडिया को जो है वो एक उनको वो क्रेडिट लेते हैं कि जिस लार्जेस्ट डेमोक्रेसी इन दी वर्ल्ड ठीक है वट एवर इट्स शॉर्ट कमिंग इट हैज कंटिन्यूड ओवर ए पीरियड ऑफ टाइम एंड द साइज ऑफ द कंट्री इट्सल्फ 
इट्स रिसोर्सेज इट्स इकोनॉमिक पोटेंशियल उसको आप मैच नहीं कर सकते लेकिन देर वॉज ए टाइम वन पाकिस्तान वॉज ए मॉडर्न डिवेलपिंग कंट्री अंटिल दी मिड नाइनटीन नाइन्टीज पाकिस्तान हैड दी हाइएस्ट पर कैपिटा इनकम इन होल ऑफ साउथ एशिया अभी इंडिया भी हमसे आगे निकल गया इंडिया बहुत पीछे था इंडिया भी आगे निकल गया बांग्लादेश भी आगे निकल गया अभी भी इंडिया में दे इज एब्जेक्ट पॉवर्टी नंबर ऑफ पुअर पीपल इन इंडिया इज मोर देन टोटल नंबर ऑफ पुअर पीपल इन दी वर्ल्ड इंक्लूडिंग अफ्रीका एंड अदर कंट्रीज वहां भी बहुत इम्बेलेंस है लेकिन वो चल रहे हैं किसी ना किसी तरह इसके ऑस में सारा कुछ ऑल दो मोदी की पॉलिसीज के लॉन्ग टर्म इफेक्ट बड़े उनके लिए नेगेटिव होंगे क्योंकि उनकी पाकिस्तान बना था एक रिलीजियस आइडियोलॉजी के ऊपर उनमें इतने रिलीजन थे इंडिया में और इतनी लैंग्वेजेस इतनी एथनिसिटीज थी कि दे वॉज नथिंग इन कॉमन तो दैट इज वाई दे वेंट फॉर सेकुलरिज्म अब जब वो हिंदू आइडियोलॉजी पे आ गए हिंदुत्वा पे तो दिस इज गोइंग टू बी डिवाइसिव फैक्टर इन इंडिया ये लॉन्ग टर्म इनका उनको नुकसान होगा लेकिन एट दी मोमेंट हमारी ये हालत है आप कल की मैं आपको बात बता रहा हूँ मैं टी वी पे न्यूज देख रहा था हमारा फॉरन मिनिस्टर कह रहा है अमेरिका में बैठ के न्यूयॉर्क में या वॉशिंगटन में इंटरव्यू दे रहा है कि हमारा कोई रशिया के साथ एग्रीमेंट नहीं हुआ हम कोई तेल रशिया से नहीं ले रहे ना वो हमें दे रहे हैं तेल एक दिन पहले आपका ऑयल मिनिस्टर जो है एनर्जी मिनिस्टर डॉक्टर मुसदक मलिक वो टी वी कह रहा है कि जी हमारा रशिया के साथ सस्ता तेल खरीदने के लिए एग्रीमेंट हो गया अब आप बाहर जब ये दोनों चली जाएंगी प्रेस कॉन्फ्रेंस स्टेटमेंट तो किस पे बिलीव करेंगे आप तो आपकी बात की वैल्यू क्या होगी मुझे बताएं यू हैव टू स्पीक विद वन वॉइस और इंडिया का ये है कि वो इंडियन जो बाहर होते हैं ना वो आपस के इख्तलाफा को बुला के तो वो इंडिया की बात करते हैं जो वहाँ से जो दूसरी तीसरी जनरेशन के लोग भी हैं ना आप देखें कि इस सारी एडमिनिस्ट्रेशन में वो पचास से ऊपर हैं जो इंडियन मुख्तलिफ इन्फ्लुशल पोजिशन पर बैठे इंक्लूडिंग द वाइस प्रेजिडेंट अगर बाइडन कॉन्क ऑफ हो जाता है कल तो वो कमला हैरिस विल भी प्रेजिडेंट तो आप ये देख लें हालात उनकी ब्यूरोसी में अब मीडियम लेवल और सीनियर लेवल पर पहुँच गए हैं इंडियन हमारे लोग जाके वहाँ टैक्सी चलाते हैं जो डॉक्टर और इंजीनियर हैं तो इसमें नहीं आते ब्यूरोसी वगैरह में इन सर्विस में ना यूनिवर्सिटियों में जाते हैं तो इसलिए हमारा कोई इन्फ्लुएंस नहीं कोई कुछ नहीं है वो जब उनके वर्स्ट तलकात भी थे हमारे बहुत अच्छे थे उस वक्त भी ज़्यादा इंडियन जा रहे थे सेटल हो रहे थे अमरीका में और रिजल्ट इज के दे आर द लार्जेस्ट ओवरसीज कम्यूनिटी इन इंडिया और इन अमेरिका तो इसलिए ये बहुत सारे फैक्टर्स हैं शेयर नंबर्स का भी उनको एडवांटेज है लेकिन वो काम भी करते हैं आप देखिए कितनी किताबें इंडिया से निकलती हैं हर साल कितनी किताबें हम लोग लिखते हैं कितने आर्टिकल वो पब्लिश करते हैं कितने हम करते हैं तो इन चीज़ों में तो हम कम्पीट कर सकते हैं ना अपने अपने लेवल के ऊपर तो हम नहीं करते और फिर सिर्फ हम कंप्लेन करते हैं जब आप हर वक्त रोते रहेंगे शिकायत करते रहेंगे तो जो है वो क्राई बेबी की तरह और विकटे मुठ का रोना रोते रहेंगे कि जी हमारे साथ तो हमेशा जाती होती रही है तो फिर आपकी बात की कोई वैल्यू नहीं होती ठीक है आपको एक प्राइड के साथ कॉन्फिडेंस के साथ सेल्फ इंश्योरेंस के साथ दुनिया में आप अपने आप को कंडक्ट कर रहे हैं अगर आपकी कमर वैसे ही झुकी हुई है तो फिर आपको कौन सीरियसली लेगा जी गुड इवनिंग सर मैं सर अमीर हमदा फ्रॉम एयर यूनिवर्सिटी एंड आई हैव टू क्वेश्चंस अबाउट न्यूक्लियर स्ट्रेटजी सर मैं बात थी क्या सरप्राइज सवाल पूछ रहे हैं बासुर हमदा एक सवाल अभी पूछना एक बात वन थिंग दैट सरप्राइज मी दैट वेरी आई एज यूनिवर्सिटी हैज बीन वेरी एक्टिव ऑल द पीपल थिंक के नेवी वाले जो है ना वो आधे पानी में सबमर्ज होते हैं ठंडे होते हैं नॉर्मली लेकिन दे इट्स लेकिन सर बैरियर का मुकाबला एयर के साथ बड़ा था इट इज प्रेजेंट टू सी बैरियर वाले बहुत एक्टिव हां जी बोलिए आई एम आस्क टू आस्क अ वन क्वेश्चन ओनली सर रशिया इज यूजिंग मेजर कंपोनेंट्स ऑफ इट्स नेशनल पावर अगेंस्ट यूक्रेन एंड विजावी नेटो he uses conventional forces use energy as a weapon and threatening the use of nuclear weapons can we say russia has practically operationalized the integrated deterrence 
a concept by the administration coined in later 22. Thank you. Uh, as you said that we need to uh, have now humanitarian ground for the independence of Kashmir. Uh, now we are changing the demography in uh, Kashmir. Uh, now Hindus are, Hindus are settling in the Kashmir. Whenever they call for the UN referendum, then what will be the response of the Pakistan? And we are thinking about it all. Uh, recent past, some uh, developments in Afghanistan regarding uh, we have seen tensions uh, around Chiman border and there was also uh, two weeks ago, I guess, uh, assassination attempt on our ambassadors in Afghanistan. Sir, what are the factors behind these developments uh, happening in Afghanistan and what should be the strategy of Pakistan in this regard? One more question. I was going to about the order. The house should be in order. So, he didn't tell us that it will be in order. That means, our military is very much in this country. They treat it like a lab, and they are very much in this country. So, let us tell you a little bit about that. And one sir, who you said, the fact that the government is going to go to any other world, or go to America, or go to any other country, पावर गेम करने की बात क्यों कर क्यों नहीं करता सिर्फ पाकिस्तान में ही क्यों होता है कि हमारे लोग जाके अमेरिका के अमेरिका को कहते हैं कि जी हमें पावर दे दो थैंक यू कि यूक्रेन में डिटेरेंस काम कर रहा है कि नहीं कर रहा इन द सिचुएशन वेर इज द न्यूक्लियर कंट्री ऑन वन साइड एंड नॉन न्यूक्लियर ऑन द अदर डिटेरेंस रशियन नेवर नीडेड टू यूज न्यूक्लियर वेपन्स अगेंस्ट यूक्रेन और डिटेर देम जो न्यूक्लियर थ्रेट उन्होंने पब्लिकली दी थी, इट वाज डायरेक्टेड एट नेटो, दैट वाज टू प्रिए प्रिवेंट फिजिकल इन्वॉल्वमेंट ऑफ नेटो फोर्सेस इन यूक्रेन, एंड दे हैव सक्सेसफुली बीन एबल टू डिटर दैट, सो वेपन्स इक्विपमेंट वगैरह तो दे रहे हैं नेटो कंट्रीज, बट दे हैव नॉट फिजि� जिसके लिए फिजिकली उनके जहाजों को आना पड़ता, they have not been able to do that, so they have the deterrence has worked, ठीक है? अब आप जो बात कर रहे हैं integrated, मैंने तो यही बात कही है कि ये cross domain deterrence, integrated ये हर दो साल के बाद नई terms वो वो fashionable कर देते हैं, निकाल देते हैं, these things were actually happening in the past as well, पहले भी ये सारी चीजें चल रही थी, they were already there. अब आप उनको पैकेज करके एक नई ये आप मुझे बताएं कि प्रोपेगंडा सेबोटाज फिफ्थ कॉलमनिस्ट गुरिला वार्फेयर ये सारी चीजें हिस्ट्री में हजारों साल से चली आ रही हैं अब हमने उसको फोर्थ जेनरेशन वार्फेयर कर लिया कोई फिफ्थ जेनरेशन वार्फेयर कहता है कोई फोर्थ जेनरेशन कोई हाइब्रिड वार कहता है तो ये कोई नई चीज नहीं है सिर्फ नई पैकेजिंग करके आपने लेबल नया लगा दिया दीज थिंग्स वर ऑलरेडी देयर अब आपका अफगानिस्तान पे क्वेश्चन था एक इधर कश्मीर का क्वेश्चन था मैं वो आई विल लीव दैट एंड अफगानिस्तान टू कर्नल नासर आपका मैं सिर्फ इतना कहता हूँ कि आपने एक स्टेटमेंट दिया ठीक है आप एमफिल के स्टूडेंट हैं ना आपने कहा जी कि हिंदू सेटल हो रहे हैं वहाँ डेमोग्राफी चेंज हो रही है ठीक है और जो है वो रिफ्रेंडम होगा तो थिंग्स माइट बी डिफिकल्ट बट योर आर्गुमेंट एंड योर स्टेटमेंट इज नॉट बेस्ड ऑन एनी फैक्ट्स आपने कोई कोशिश की है स्टैटिस्टिक्स कटा करने की कि पहले कंपोजिशन जो थी ये आर्टिकल जो थी इसका है थर्टी फाइव है जो जिसमें वो डेमोग्राफी वो जब उन्होंने जब तक रिपील नहीं किया था उससे पहले क्या डेमोग्राफिक कंपोजिशन थी कश्मीर की और अब क्या है अब तक कितने लोग वहाँ सेटल हो चुके हैं कोई डेटा होगा ना किसी ने वर्कआउट किया होगा तो आप रिसर्च करें आप इस तरह का स्टेटमेंट जब देते हैं विदाउट द बेसिस ऑफ फैक्ट्स एंड फिगर्स तो फिर आपकी बात की वैल्यू नहीं यही हमारा प्रॉब्लम है हम यू में खड़े हो जाते हैं वहाँ जाते हैं जो पैलेट गंज मार के ना तो अंधा कर दे कश्मीरियों को और तस्वीर वहाँ दिखा देते हैं पैलेस्टाइन की ठीक है और उधर आपका जो है ना तालियम आपके ऊपर बजट ही है तो माशा आपका बात जाता है बुखाये बजाय आपकी बात को भी सीरियसली देखें 
तो इसलिए जब इस तरह की बात करते हैं तो आप पहले रिसर्च करें देखें कि थोरेटिकली यस दिस विल डू दैट हैज इट हैपन्ड ऑलरेडी और नॉट एंड टू व्हाट एक्सटेंट इट हैज हैपन्ड ये आप पहले ट्राई टू फाइंड आउट दिस इंफॉर्मेशन एंड देन यू विल बी इन अ बेटर पोजीशन टू आस्क दिस क्वेश्चन और फिर आपको उसका जवाब भी बेहतर मिल सकेगा ठीक है अफगानिस्तान का मैं सिर्फ थोड़ा सा बात करूंगा कि बात ये है इनफैक्ट मैं अफगानिस्तान में छोड़ देता हूँ ये आप जो बात कर रहे थे मिलिट्री के रोल की सारा कुछ देखिए मैं क्या बात कर रहा हूँ हमें अपनी इकोनॉमी दुरुस्त करने की जरूरत है हमें अपनी इंस्टीट्यूशन को सीधा करने की जरूरत है इंस्टीट्यूशन मीन्स योर पार्लियामेंट योर जुडिशरी योर मिलिट्री योर मीडिया योर ब्यूरोसी सब उसमें शामिल है एक जमाने में पाकिस्तान की जो सिविल ब्यूरोक्रेसी थी इट वाज आउटस्टैंडिंग और इसने नॉट ओनली बड़े इफेक्टिव ब्यूरोक्रेट पैदा किए बल्कि बड़े बड़े इंटेलेक्चुअल भी पैदा किए पीपल लाइक कुदरतुल्ला शहा अलताफ गौहर आप ये वो देखे वो मुजफ्फर वारसी और बहुत सारे लोग हैं मुस्तफ़ा जैदी और बड़े बड़े जो इनके शायर भी थे और अब वो अपना प्रोफेशनली काम भी जानते थे आप हमारी ब्यूरोसी की हालत आप देख लें कि उनका लेवल क्या है उनका नॉलेज बेस क्या है और क्या चीज़ है तो डिटेरेशन बहुत हुई है उसकी एक तो वजह यह है कि 73 में जो सिविल सर्विस रूल्स थे वो भुट्टो ने मॉडिफाई किए थे बिकॉज ही वॉन्टेड टू सॉर्ट आउट द ब्यूरोसी उसके लिए उसने वो एक प्रोटेक्शन होती थी अगर आप डिप्टी कमिश्नर हैं तो आपने टेन्योर अपना पूरा करना है कोई पॉलिटिकल गवर्नमेंट आपको ट्रांसफर नहीं कर सकती ये जब खत्म कर दिया गया तो आप कुछ जरा उसकी मर्जी के लोग कहते जी ये जुलूस निकले हैं इनको डंडे मारो तो अगर वो इनकार कर देता है उसको उठा के एसओ लगा देते हैं वो ओ लगा देते हैं ठीक है कुंडे लाइन भेज देते हैं इसलिए पोलिटिकल एफिलियशन हो गई है दे शो द लॉयल्टी टू दी पोलिटिकल गवर्नमेंट ऑफ द टाइम नॉट दी स्टेट और रिजल्ट ये होता है कि फिर जब दूसरी पोलिटिकल गवर्नमेंट आती है कहते अच्छा ये उनके साथ मिला हुआ था वो उसको खुडे लाइन लगा देते हैं और अपने बंदों को आगे ले जाते हैं तो दिस इज हाउ वी हैव मेड ए बेस्ट आउट ऑफ इट फिर लेटरल एंट्री का शुरू कर दिया उसने बेड़ा खड़ा कर दिया हमारी फॉरन सर्विस का बाकी चीज़ों का मिलिट्री हैज टू डू इट्स जॉब स्टे इन इट्स ओन टू मेन इट हैज नथिंग टू डू विद पॉलिटिक्स शुड नॉट डेवल इन पॉलिटिक्स होता ये है कि जब पाकिस्तान बना था ना तो दे वॉज नो एक्सपीरियंस इन आर पॉलिटिशियंस गवर्नमेंट का किसी को कोई एक्सपीरियंस नहीं था ब्यूरोसी जो बल था वो इंडिया में चला गया था थोड़े से लोग हमारे से आए थे कोई ऑफिस नहीं थे कोई इंफ्रास्ट्रक्चर नहीं था लेकिन ब्यूरोसी जो थी आई थी वो सौ साल पुरानी ट्रेडिशन थी ब्रिटिश ट्रेन थी आर्मी का भी सौ डेढ़ सौ साल ब्रिटिश इंडियन आर्मी से चले आ रहे थे तो दीज वर दी टू मोस्ट एक्सपीरियंस इंस्टीट्यूशन पॉलिटिशियंस राइट फ्रॉम दिगलिंग बिकेम डिपेंडेंट ऑन दैम and to our bad luck kairism died very soon and then after few years yaqat ali khan was also lost so jab leadership weak ho gayi to dependence badhti chali gayi military ke upar aur civil uh, bureaucracy ke upar in dono ki collusion ki wajah se then they grabbed the power isi wajah se aap dekhe ki ye weakness thi political governments ki कि अयूब खान वाइल इन यूनिफॉर्म ही वॉज कमांडर इन चीफ ऑफ द आर्मी उसको डिफेंस मिनिस्टर लगा लिया था कैबिनेट में वाइल ही वॉज स्टिल आर्मी चीफ और वो यूनिफॉर्म में बैठता था कैबिनेट मीटिंग्स में तो उसके पे टेम्पेशन होनी थी ना टेक ओवर करने की तो ये ये प्रॉब्लम्स हैं हमारे तो अब वो जो आपका पार्शली ये क्वेश्चन है और अफगानिस्तान वाला और भी डॉक्टर नासिर ठीक है ना और इट्स नॉट पॉसिबल 
मगर पॉसिबल ही नहीं है ना जो उन्होंने कहा वो पॉसिबल नहीं है तो रोल ऑफ मिलिट्री इन पॉलिटिक्स ये सवाल ना पाकिस्तान की सियासत में और पावर अच्छा मैंने आपको कहा कि आप सब कुछ जांच करें तो मैं छोटी सी जांच करूं जैसे मैं वो बैठ के वहाँ फटाफट बनाते हैं चीज और पेश करते हैं ठीक है जब आप अपना काम नहीं जब मुझे बताएं कितने पॉलिटिकल पार्टीज के पास ये एनालिसिस सेंस हैं जो फॉरेन पॉलिसी या किसी ने भी नहीं किया हुआ पैसे जेब में तो फिर जब आप बात होती है तो आप वहाँ जब सुन रहे हैं ब्रीफिंग तो आप क्या उस पेंट को दे सकते हैं यू आर डिपेंडेंट तो इसे आओ यू एप्लीकेट यू आओ तो जो बात मैं आपको बता रहा हूँ ना कि हम सारे क्रिटिसाइज करना चाहते हैं और एक रियलिटी से आप कह रहे हैं इसकी करीब तरीके हैं लेकिन इसका ह if you think you are not interested in politics, then politics is interested in you. If you all leave the politics to the वही उसी पुराने सिस्टम में तो then then nothing will change. सबसे पहला कॉन्सेप्ट ये है कि आप लोग अगर एक चीज को सही समझते हैं तो उसमें पार्टिसिपेट करें, उसमें पार्टिसिपेट करें इन वन वे और दिया था जो भी आपको नजर आता है, ठीक है? तो पावर खुद बहुत फ्लो करेगी, पावर फ्लो कर जाती है पावर कभी किसी के हाथ में नहीं जाती अभी बड़ी रैपिडली पावर फ्लो हो ही हुई है पावर जहाँ पड़ी थी वहाँ पे नहीं है अभी उतनी नहीं है जितनी पहले होती थी पावर हैज ऑलरेडी फ्लोन ठीक है अब उसको कोई कैपिटलाइज नहीं करेगा वापस चली जाएगी समझिए बात को ये बात बिल्कुल बड़ी क्लियर और सादी सी बात है अगर कोई काम नहीं करेगा तो कोई कर जाएगा जो कर जाएगा वहाँ पावर ट्रांसफर हो जाएगी खुद और नजर यही आप ठीक है अच्छा अफगानिस्तान हमारे जान में कुछ भी नहीं होगा। हमारे ऊपर अटैक हुआ, इंडियन पे भी अटैक होता है, अमेरिकन पे भी अटैक होता है, तो अटैक करवाना हमारे जान में कोई मसला नहीं है, कोई भी करवा सकता है। वहाँ पे नॉन्स अभी हमारे तालेबान इतनी कोई वेल स्ट्रक्चर्ड किस्म की उनकी लेआउट नहीं है, वहाँ पे कोई आर्मी प्रोफेशनल आर्मी उस तरह नहीं खड़ी हो सकी ना ब्रोकरेसी उस तरह खड़ी हो सकी है वहाँ पे एक लूज स्ट्रक्चर है उसमें हर किस्म के लोग पार्टिसिपेट कर रहे हैं और दे कैन डू सर्टेन एक्टिविटीज वो अनडिजायरेबल एक्ट भी हो सकती है बाद में हो सकता है रॉन्ग पॉलिसी से भी हो सकता है वी डोंट गेट वर्ल्ड जैसे डॉक्टर ने आपको कहा था कि एक चीज कहीं दूर में हो जाती है तो उसको हम पूरी स्टेट की रिस्पॉन्सिबिलिटी नहीं बन जाती कि उससे एक नतीजा आकर्षक ले जाए कि अफगानिस्तान से एक थ्रेट जनरेट हो रहा है वहाँ पे एक थ्रेट ऑलरेडी है उसका एक नेचर है उसको हैंडल करने का एक तरीका कार है बट इट इज नॉट सब्सटेंशियल कि वो हमारे लिए बहुत बड़ा कोई थ्रेट है ऐसा कुछ भी नहीं है वो स्क्रमिश है वो चलती रहेंगी वो कोई ना कोई वहाँ पे डिसिडेंट ग्रुप्स है तालिबान के अंदर भी छोटे-छोटे फैक्शन हो सकते हैं, उनका आपस में डिसएग्रीमेंट हो सकता है और सामने कैन फंड देम, वो ऐसा कुछ हो सकता है, लेकिन कोई इसमें बहुत बड़ा प्रॉब्लम ना रहे। कश्मीर का जहाँ तक तालक है, कश्मीर की अब ये देखें, ज्योग्राफिकली जगहों को कैप्चर करने का जो एरा था ना वो कब खत्म तो इस वॉर ऑफ ऑक्यूपेशन अब खत्म है ठीक है अब पाकिस्तान भी यहाँ से वॉर करके इंडिया में कोई एरिया ऑक्यूपाई नहीं कर सकता नहीं करना चाहता है क्या पाकिस्तान इंडिया को ऑक्यूपाई करना चाहते ये गजवा हिंद वाले जो लोग हैं ना गजवा हिंद वाले लोग उनको शायद ये उनके ख्याल है ये लेकिन प्रैक्टिकली ये पॉसिबल नहीं है ये अमरीका नहीं कर सकता तो आप भी नहीं कर सकते ठीक है तो वॉर ऑफ ऑक्यूपेशन नहीं है हाँ वो जो दूसरी बात है ना वो ये इन्फ्लुंस की बात है इन्फ्लुएंस इंक्रीज होता रहता है और वो होगा और उसमें आपने एफर्ट कर दिए कश्मीर पाकिस्तान की जो अनरिजॉल्व एजेंडा है उसका हिस्सा है हम उसको मैंने इसकी चार पॉइंट आपको रिपीट जो आप इंटेलेक्चुअली उसको इंगेज करना है वहाँ पे इंडिया सारी जिंदगी कोशिश करता रहेगा करता रहे है और आगे भी चलता रहेगा हमारी अपनी जो एफर्ट है जो आप कर सकते हैं वो हमें जो डोमेन लिमिटेड सी रहेगी उसमें उतना करना पड़ेगा सो आई थिंक वी हैव वंडरफुल इवेंट सो वी uh, first of all, thank you so much for your patience and I hope that you, all of you had productive uh, day and full of learning and everything. Uh, you guys need to be punctual by tomorrow. Uh, it's a request, it's a humble request. Uh, we are discussing amongst ourselves that instead of starting at 9, we are going probably going to start at 9.30 tomorrow and we hope that everyone should be here by that time. And apart from that, uh, you guys love to take photos and uh, selfies and everything. You can use this background, take photos and upload them on Twitter and use the hashtags I just provided you in our, in our uh, group. And uh, apart from that, some students were asking me about uh, the course I recommended. 
basically uh, it's a skills and centers uh, strategic learning initiative uh, it's a course that you can complete uh, on your own uh, it's an online course you can decide to complete in one day or a, or a month that's up to you and it's a certificate and to tell you the truth it helped me a lot during my job interview for the svr so it's a good thing it's ha it has details about the deterrence and balance in the related nice. concepts so so that's it on my end uh, we'll assemble here for the group photo and then you and guys uh, will go outside for the tea thank you so much once again one more Yes. Yeah.